doctor diagnosed with pneumonia about a week ago. And he didn't exactly respond to pneumonia. He went up yesterday for an x ray. He said he had a pretty fair shape. Who was that day? Uh, Barlow. Oh. Barlow who works here. Yeah. Our secretary. Yeah. God our heavenly Father, we are thankful for the privilege of prayer. We're thankful for the privilege of assembly. We pray that as we deliberate on matters vital to us and our families and the well-being of all working people, that we might know the leading of our Holy Spirit. May we be obedient to follow this. May our decisions be pleasing to thee. Forgive us for all the times that we fail to recognize thee. Make us all feel our dependence upon thee for life and all of its sustenance. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well now, let me advise you at the outset the length of this amendment, uh, the length of this meeting is going to be dependent upon how much oration we have. We have, on the members of the committee, we have a number of things that we need to get some action on, and I passed out a a ream of material for you to take home and study. I didn't necessarily want you to read it at this meeting. Some of it you'll have to make reference to in the course of the meeting. But some of it is simply for information purposes. Uh, I know how busy all of you are. It's kind of hard for you to take off a full day from your duties at least the next two days so we hope we can get this thing through where you can get back home and so forth before the day is over. Now we passed out among other things what I referred to as the bare bones budget which you can look over and it's based upon the anticipated affiliation of 36,500 members. That's, that includes several locals that uh, are in arrears with their dues. They haven't, we haven't given up on them yet. We hope that their dues money will come through. It's also well, based upon... Huh? You misread that. 36,500? That was what we would have to have to balance. We don't have the 34,788. And there's uh, 2,000 of those in arrears. I've already misinterpreted the budget. That started off on a bad foot start there. You should be better informed. I wish we had the 30, 36, but we don't. No, we're so back on got 32. Apparently, apparently then we anticipate that Pipe Fed is local and Cotton is local in Pascagoula. <laughs> yeah, if, we had the 70, if we had the 36, Bob Fly, Fly, Bob, 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 how many of them locals you done got affiliated in Natchez? Now, we 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 doing some work on them, though. You ought to get national, uh, Diamond National CWA without too much trouble. Yeah, about? they coming in right away. I mean, I we'll talk about this tomorrow in Brookhaven, so I'm, I'm sure. When what we, about? Yeah, I talked to both of those people already. Mm -hmm. The bricklayers. We're going to get all of them. Somebody said he's behind. He's out. He's probably he behind. Well, we, we anticipate getting all of the bricklayers. They're not on there. They're not in. We anticipate getting all of the bricklayers statewide affiliated as a result of getting them getting affiliated with the Appalachian Council. The director of that program is a bricklayer, and he has is highly incensed over the fact that no bricklayers are affiliated with this organization. He has took this upon himself as a personal project. So within the next few months, hope we works. hope we'll have all of them in. Hope it works. Uh, now, we're going to ask Brother Schaefer first to tell you about his experience with the table. Would regards to the salaries that you uh, propose for the officers, let you know where we stand with that situation at this time. Well, uh, 
first I tried to get an audience with uh, Amy Cameron, the state director, and I was unable to get with him. So in order to try to progress the thing as far as fast as we could, um, <coughs> I talked with one of his assistants, Mr. Harris, and uh, he pointed out a few things to me that should be done. And one is anything in excess of 5%. Uh, we would have to try to justify it through inequities. Well, we took this approach, and of course, uh, two years ago, the increase that was granted uh, amounted to something like, what, 20.3% or something of this nature. The way you arrive at the figure is you take the base period of three years, total up the increases that has been granted, divide it by three, and if you come out with excess of seven percent, then you're restricted to the guideline of 5.5 percent, huh. unless uh, you can get some exceptions. So, of course, we had to go back and uh, start to work for the exceptions. Uh, the exceptions being inequities in the salaries from the beginning approach, I guess you'd say, that we took. So we got uh, a survey, national survey of like officers, uh, comparable in membership in the year comparison as we could get from Stanley Smith, which is for instance. Plus uh, additional workload, uh, which the officers have assumed, and we have filed it. We uh, ask that it not be reviewed on the local level. This was the recommendation of Cameron. I did uh, get a meeting with him uh, about what a week and a half after the surgery, right? Maybe two weeks. But he said that uh, after our uh, conversation about it, that there's no point in him hearing it again in order to expedite the thing, just waiving the hearing on the local level and send it on to Washington. So we're still <coughs> waiting for a reply from the board in Washington. They said it might take six weeks, it might take six months. <coughs> they had no idea how long it would take to get a reply on a matter of this nature. I told them to gauge it by George Mina's appeal granted by the Mississippi by the National AFL-CIO, and maybe that would give them some guidelines. So Cameron said that his knowledge is that not been approved either. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that wasn't really the thing to say, was it? No. So he, uh, <coughs> he suggested that we go ahead and put in the 5.5%. Uh, simple reason that there is no ground rules for retroactivity for a deal of this nature. Oh. I suggested after my conversation got started with Harris that for him to just forget that I'd talk to him and we'd go ahead and put it in effect and let them do whatever they do if they want it. He said, no, I don't think that's the way to play the game. I said, well, that's the answer I expect you to <laughs> But anyway, uh, that's the status of it. We're waiting to hear from the cost of the Well, with all the... Or paperwork. With all the labor members leaving some of that stuff, I don't know what sort of shuffle we'll get. Well, since uh, Jack got into this thing and, and he's made a report, I might advise you about discussion I had with Stan Smith in Washington the week before last about the matter, and he suggests that we set up an account and deposit the difference in it in the 5.5, just hold it there and we get a ruling or something. Then after we've discussed this matter further, Mr. Phillips did with our auditor and some other people we have confidence in, we've decided the best way to handle it just need to commit his approval. Instead of setting up a separate account, which would 
eventually be questioned. It's just simply just for her to set up a separate set of books for good bookkeeping purposes. And, uh, sure. and, and keep it in, in her file. Just leave the money in the general fund. Then if anything develops at a later date, it can be paid to us as a bonus or something. Right. You know, if we got the money. If we haven't, then we'll just have to go along with the five on five. That's how simple it'll be. But I think this will probably be the best approach to it instead of setting up a separate account, which in itself would be questionable. Mm -hmm. You see, that it'd be, she just keep books on it as to how much home amounts to, maybe do it on a month to month or quarter to quarter basis something like this so it, that's all right with you guys that's what we'll do if we get some kind of a rule along the same line uh, okay. for brother Brian Kelly you know we have this little thrift plan or savings plan yeah right uh, established for uh, poor people yeah and uh, of course it's operated under uh, bylaws Discuss the possibility of making a deposit into this account, but under the bylaws, and what little I understand on the thing, uh, we would be liable on that in as much as any time that the teacher might terminate. Yeah. Uh, the money is accessible to them. So right. It's a questionable thing. Now, if it was retirement, uh, projected out at retirement, a predetermined retirement date, I think you could put the money in there without question. Right. Mr. Chase, do you remember this is set up? I've already got some forms from the Internal Revenue in my office that's got to come down money. Uh, you know, the employees that can't set up in the, uh, the council's name? Right. We've got to start filing some forms on that because, see, it's drawing interest and nobody's reporting that interest. Right. Now, what are we going to do on that? We're not in <coughs> profit, Yeah, but you're not as an and yes. we're, we're reporting out but the council's part is not being reported to anybody. We've got yeah, this forms the now that we're going to have to start employed, filing. Mississippi FLCIO employees. See, their two and a half percent goes into, I don't know why we set it up putting the council's part into a separate account, and ours is put into our name. Well, now we've got to do something on the council. There's some reservations in the bylaws as to whether you get the council's money or not. So you've is got a condition to meet right. before yeah. you can get it. Right. Well, I couldn't remember what, what that, why that was, but yeah. now we, we, they're questioning us on that. I think it'll just be it's a matter of filing a form. form. I don't Sometimes believe it in it. We never I don't had believe it be any payment they, involved. They found out about it through these numbers that you have to It's probably a 990, some, right. some well, section of 990. We already filed 990. But you may have to file on that particular right. fund. I know. I don't know what we're going to do. We need to come down with numbers. I'm glad I don't have no duties on financial sector. Jack, when you were talking, I don't know much about going on the paperwork, but the way I got around the paperwork, when I gave my secretary a raise, I gave the biggest part of it through the expense. And I didn't count that as part of the 5%. I don't think, you know, I was thinking about the fact this might have been what we should have done with the clothes and the time, you know, paper. Yeah, but with an expense account, he got the answer the internal revenue, what he did with that. That's right. So well, then you'd have restrictions huh? under our Constitution and bylaws that set, see, and then you, it'd require a whole rewrite of that if you change the expense set up. I think the, the, the <laughs> thing that I've outlined to you is on the, the, on the sensible approach. To Just it. keep Just books on keep it, books that's books what I say. We'll wait and see what develops, and if, if we finally clear it finally clears up and we've got the money, then y'all can vote us to bonus or something like that. That's yeah. about the only way I can see it handled. And we well, they, they agreed to go ahead and allow us to put the 5.5 in the yeah, place, well, so right we've right. done that. Mm -hmm. See. But the difference between that and what we voted to give them, they'd set up. And of course, as I <coughs> pointed out to you, and everybody was dead when we had the board meeting uh, after the convention, you know, we had very little time to take up a lot of things we should have done, and we didn't even get a picture of the board, and we got to do that. Uh, First time we get them all together again. 
down notice when you yeah, so, I didn't uh, think about it till later. I, frankly, we had planned on the board meeting the following morning. Some of you guys had to get out of town. And oh, later we'd done been here a week. I had to go. Wasn't the been there, so uh, <laughs> there wasn't no point having a photographer come down the next morning and take a picture of six people. So uh, we, we still want to get pictures of the board. I have an idea. Board. We're going to have to get a picture of part of them at the time. Paste it. Paste you know, yeah. They can run it in. And make a picture. <laughs> You're pretty good job. Yeah, they I might uh, All right. say this uh, in behalf of the races. Uh, Cameron was very much impressed with the fact that a few people are entitled to the race. He surprised us. He was the size we were making. Everybody thinks we're making fifty thousand dollars apiece. He was real surprised that two people. Bring it up and if he drove out in front of my house, he had for sale or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, now listen, if it's agreeable to you guys for the time being, we'll handle it as we've outlined. Has anybody seen anything wrong with doing it this way? Now, we got a number of items here on this thing, and I'm just going to briefly run through some of them with things we've got to talk about, and y'all can be judgment in about how much time you want to spend on each one of them. We just got through one of them. We want to talk about an automobile insurance program that the West Virginia Council has put into effect, and I've sat in on a meeting in Washington with, which will amount to considerable savings. So our members, if we can get it going down here, and uh, it runs something like a 16% savings. As soon as that uh, we get the Appalachian Council thing funded, we'll set up a meeting and invite Miles Stanley down, and he'll explain the program. We want to spend a little time on the Choctaw Indian project, let you know where that stands, what we've been doing in connection with it. Uh, we want to pick up the. Uh, <coughs> Uh, a program we've been discussing with some people out of the governor's office, that copy of that charter I passed out to you, uh, that's, that's the reason for that, because it's what we're going to talk about now will be tied in with that charter. And of course, one of the most important items of the business is this senatorial race. This committee is going to act as the uh, screening or interviewing committee or evaluation committee for the senatorial race. We'll have to be prepared to make a report to the meeting on the 29th on that. Uh, I want to bring you up to date on the legislature where we stand on a couple of bills of importance to our membership. Tom's going to want to talk a little bit about the drug program. Uh, then I think, Tom, I've added a couple of things here while you were down at the meeting this morning. I think we need to also spend a little time and get your opinions on this cockeyed situation we're trying to deal with as far as the Democratic Party is concerned. Uh, you might want to delay this convention thing till the next meeting. We, we'll have to make a decision in the very near future on, on the, uh, the place uh, and date and so forth, not necessarily date, at least the place of the next convention two years from now. You have to start planning these things two years in advance in order to get hotel accommodations. Now, you might want to delay that to the next meeting on the 29th. I think we explain could probably. Explain this, Claude, and the reason this was given. Why? I want to explain this on the. I can't see that far. What you got? The convention expense. It really should be saved till we discuss the future convention so they can see how much the convention costs and in regards to setting registration fees for the next convention. Yeah, well, they, they can take this, that's what I say, they can take they this home with them for study. See, a lot of this stuff I give them is for them to take home and read and study. That that would naturally apply it and to give you some idea about what it costs to put on a convention. Uh, <clears throat> then, uh, if, you, if you recall, the convention uh, authorized me to set up a committee to study the constitution of the organization in regards to a number of things, including the election or selection of board members. And uh, then another thing, Tom, I got in the mail last night from, from uh, Ebersole, and you ought to have a copy of that on also, is the number of items that he has listed and suggested that we uh, 
<coughs> consider as far as setting up that week-long labor institute over at uh, Mississippi State on August the 14th through the 18th. He mailed it to my home last night. Now, that's the number of things I've got on, and some of you might have a few things that you want to bring up, so that just gives you an idea about the number of things that, uh, that we need to talk about. Now, if you, if you will uh, allow me, we can pass over the automobile insurance program. If you will simply authorize me to invite Miles Stanley down and explain the program, call a meeting of, we, of the executive committee, and of course I think this ought to be authorized by the board meeting next, uh, in other words, get the board to allow the committee to negotiate this matter, and if I have without having to call a full board meeting for that purpose. But uh, what, what, what we've got going is simply this, that uh, we have now become a full-fledged member of the Appalachian Council. Uh, which uh, means that we are now in a position to work through that organization for the manpower training and development programs that they've been uh, moving with throughout the Appalachian region. And our primary project, of course, is the Choctaw Indian thing, which we reviewed with you briefly, at least at the old board meeting. And, of course, Steve is on board already as the coordinator of that program. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they're in the process now of negotiating funds with the Department of Labor to fund the program. We don't know how much money is going to be available for Mississippi uh, through the Appalachian Council for, the, for, for any program until it's funded. Now, after we know how much money we got to spend, then we, Miles would like to come to Mississippi. Uh, to view the Choctaw uh, project. It's going to be one of the biggest things that, uh, that they've ever got involved in. It really is, because we talk about building the whole damn community out there on that reservation and final analysis. And while he's here, we'd like to have a meeting of the committee, you see, to talk about the insurance program and see if you want to participate in it. So we'd just like to delay that, we'll take this up with the board meeting, see if we can get them to authorize the executive <coughs> committee to negotiate with Miles on the low-cost automobile insurance program. And then while he's here, we'll make arrangements to go with him over to see the reservation. Then we'll also uh, be in a position to report to you the amount of money we'll have to spend on these different programs. Now basically, benefit of the new board members, the Appalachian Council was formed several years ago, and its its primary purpose is to uh, recruit and train underprivileged people in some of the skilled trades, and then, of course, place them on some other jobs as well. We have <coughs> other programs, uh, you know, similar similar to the uh, outreach thing you have in fast school at Kelly. But I think we can tie it all together. I don't see any problems there. But they do have one phase of this program that should be very attractive to the building tradesmen. And that's the fact that there will be some money made uh, whereby we can, can help the building trades put in a program to upgrade their membership on new methods and changes in materials and all that in construction. Again, all of this depends on the amount of money they get in final analysis. So with your permission, we'll pass over that. Now, on the Choctaw project at the present time, this is the status of that. We, uh, <coughs> uh, we uh, went ahead and as a result of, uh, of our previous discussion, and this, of course, is not new to the old members, but the, the two new members here are not familiar with us. We agreed they had the money enough uh, uh, on hand, the council did, uh, after, you know, the Indians went to them asking for help. And then they came to us and asked us if we had helped sponsor it, and I felt that the board would concur in this, so I went ahead on my own and said, yes, we will. So to make a long story short, they had enough money on hand to hire three instructors. Uh, to teach 40 young Indians 
in three trades, carpentry, bricklaying, and painters. Now, there was a period of 20 weeks involved. One was a on the job, was a pre-job training thing, then 12 weeks on the job training, which then they should be given tests and so forth, and those that could qualify for the indentured apprenticeship program would be, become indentured at that point. Uh, that eight weeks has, is up. We had to get in there and work out an arrangement to keep them together with some other funds until they get funded again for some more housing money. Uh, we still, we've got an adult education program going over there now that we help them get going, and the kids now are involved in that, and we've worked out an arrangement to keep them together. And I've been uh, on the telephone with the HUD people and uh, Rubel Phillips and some other people about, about some quick action on funding uh, 60 more units of housing on the reservation, whereby these kids then can get their on-the-job training. Now, the chief told me this morning that they have a meeting at 1.30 Monday with the HUD people. Rubel Phillips, who I guess carries the big stick as far as the Republicans are concerned, assured me of his cooperation. And hopefully by the middle of next week, we'll have that thing funded. They can begin work on the, on the housing program again, and we'll get these kids on the job. Now, again, the expansion of this program will be dependent upon the amount of money that we get in final analysis from the Department of Labor. This includes the training program on the reservation and the training program for the building trades. Uh, I don't think we're at any point yet for you to ask for any action from you on this, but it's just a matter of information. When we get all the facts, then it will be necessary for some action on the part of the committee or the executive board. The other item that we need some action on is this. Uh, I was approached just recently by a, a gentleman who was working with the governor's office, and you'll see that proclamation uh, issued out of the governor's office creating this agency. Uh, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but we, we've had well, in addition to a couple of private meetings with the, with the uh, representative and a couple of more people, we wound up here one night in a meeting at which we invited Bob Thomas to come up and sit in on because we might thought we might need the cooperation of the outreach program there, plus the Appalachian Council thing. And, and, and if I can get it down in a few words, this is what it's going to really add up to. They have a new program that even I wasn't familiar with on, on building houses for low-income people. They got some kind of arrangements whereby people under $3,000 will receive a supplement in order to purchase the home. Uh, we're strictly in the talking stages of the thing right now. But I'm advised by the people from the governor's office that they, that they are very much interested in, in, in our participation and in our assistance in this particular program. As a matter of fact, they want us to think about setting up a nonprofit corporation of this organization and take over and run this particular program. Now, it's going to involve, it's going to be a pilot program strictly. It's going to involve a, a small operation in the beginning and working about 30 people to build prefabricated homes, low-cost homes. And it's understood that whatever we do will be with union labor, that we will recruit and train people in this program for the trades. In other words, we're not going to have anything to do with anything that the guy doesn't wind up as being a member of a union when he gets through. And when it comes to the erection of the home, then this, of course, would have to be done with our building tradesmen and so forth. All of these details will have to be worked out. Uh, 
Then there's a place in this program we think for the Appalachian Council, and on the recruiting end of it, probably the outreach thing, Russell, were involving Bob Thomas. Uh, I think the thing has merit for several reasons. If it's successful, it's going to mean that we're going to be in control of a very important, important segment of the building industry. And there is one hell of a need for homes in this state all over the state, as everybody knows, especially as far as low-income families are concerned. It will give us an entree into the home building industry, which is pretty well rat constructed already. You know, most all the home building is just being put up by non-union labor. And I told the guys in our meeting that, uh, well, you know, this is socialism. Uh, eliminating the profit factor. And you can bet your life that once the word gets out to, to the, to the uh, non-union construction industry in this state, uh, what's going on, there will be a big howl go up that we're willing to take the gas, <laughs> provided you guys are willing to, to back us up. Now, they want to know what our position is. Uh, he's got to get something in uh, around by no later than the first of next month. I the difference in this and the turnkey problem they had down on the coast. It's something similar to that, Bob, yet, but it is a little bit different. Uh, it's, uh, what did they call that thing, mainstream or something? It's a new program. Uh, and this will be. Well, I've heard, I mean, I read a little bit about it, but they yeah, got a turnkey. Turnkey is a low income housing. Well, we got project. one starting at home. We're fixing to get started a uh, turnkey but, project. But it's a little bit different from that, in as much it, uh, it goes way down, more or less, for people that are even eligible for welfare assistance. Then they'll get a, some kind of a subsidy which will in turn allow them enough money to plot against the cost of a home. <laughs> uh, something completely new. Well, I was wondering what the difference there. They got about three and there's only I think he told us is that there's going to be a pilot project established uh, throughout the United States, and this will be one of the eight. You see. It's going to be a federal project, but it's going to be run by the state. Well, it'll be federal funded. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, and it's going to be run through the governor's office. Right. As you know, most all of the, they, they're decentralizing on most all of the programs now. A lot of this stuff uh, is going to be channeled through the governor's office instead of through Washington. And uh, I think it would give us an opportunity, you know, to, to get on the inside. Uh, is it going to be houses or apartment units? No, it's going to be houses. Individual houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I realize all I have give you is just kind of a bear outline the thing. Uh, we don't have all the What, what are you really yet. seeking from us, Claude? Uh, sanction to sponsor sanction it? Sanction for us to, uh, to sit down with them and, and, and really negotiate <coughs> the proposition and then in final analysis to bring it back to you for action. We just want authority to sit down and deal with them and give them authority to go ahead and make the proposal. And before we sign any contract, we'll bring it back to the executive committee or the board for final approval. In other words, they don't even have their program drafted yet. The governor's got to send right. in his request to Washington. Right. You just want authority to sit down and go over that right. with them. Right. Well, I'm so <coughs> moved. Okay. I second that. All right. Any further discussion? <coughs> all right. All in favor of the motion signify to say an aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, Mr. The man's name is Nave that we've been dealing with. He has a Kentuckian. Can I ask you one question on that? Well, yes. There's probably nothing we can do, but in any way that it can be part of the electric specification to make people build these houses. Somebody sooner or later in the government, state, or local has got to step in and tell these people in these low rural districts and all that they're going to have to keep the grass cut and the yard cleaned up and put the windows back in them. You ought to see some of these places in the house still that are two years old. Man, it looked like Hurricane Camille didn't do anything compared to the way those buildings were. There needs to be something in the specifications to make those people clean them up or just take them away from them. Just I agree. 
we shall talk to the gentleman about that. I'll just say it. Yeah, you know, it's hard. Well, well, you see, this is now, part this of what's happening, Pastor Bill, with some of those big new housing projects. I can take it out of the ship. You know, they tore Carver Village down and rebuilt it. Looks like well, they tore it down again since they rebuilt it. But Looks like Grandma will come in and talk to Katie, don't you? I can't see it. Well, it's pretty hard. You pick up the dump and put another paper. Next time you're downtown, I'll kill you. You don't have to show you, me. You I know talk, exactly you what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Well, you see what you've got here, and it's it's something that, that I think some of these uh, so-called black leaders, uh, uh, if they really want to do co something constructive for their people, should become concerned about some of these kinds of problems instead of sitting back and every damn time somebody like the governor does something constructive, he ain't done enough, yak, 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 you see. So I think they have an obligation themselves to get out here and teach people that have been living in these shacks, you know, how, 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 to, how, how to go about <coughs> living in a decent home and taking care of it. This is part of the problem. You know, J.B. Carter down there. Yeah. They got him and Big Reese. He's a big black and white relation at the West Bank. That's what Reese told me the other day. He said it's time for the blacks to quit falling about being discriminated against and go ahead and take some of these jobs and do something. So we've got everything in the world we ever wanted, it, except the people forgot one thing. They need to get out and get these jobs that they fought for. Now they're sitting around, they don't have anything to argue about. They, learn, they need to learn they got certain <laughs> responsibilities to go along with it, is what it amounts to. We'll get on to that part of it a little bit later on also, dealing with well, the party right, system. Uh, the Catholic has uh, uh, sponsored some of these things, and they're doing a good job with the houses that they build. They keep it clean. I know they are at home. They uh, teach them. Well, in some situations, uh, they have courses to teach these families how to live in a decent they're doing home that and take care Catholic of Catholic sponsored uh, units that they built, and they, they actually went out there and did it. Okay, we got that out of the way. Let's see. I'm going to save that senatorial thing more or less to the end of the meeting uh, and get some of these other uh, things out of the way. <coughs> because I think, uh, let me ask you, is anybody here in a real hurry to get away? What, what's the other, the uh, latest state some of you need to leave? Latest today? Yeah. What's your schedule, James? You use the opportunity. I, I need to get back if I can. If I can't, I can't. <laughs> Before closing hours? Yeah. I close at 5, and I need to be back because I'm going to be away over the weekend. I won't be back there no more until Tuesday. Well, and if I'm we leave move it again, now, move with Thursday, rather, Wednesday, and I get back till it Sunday. It might be possible. Go. Now, I, I go told them to have the lunch set for 12, but we might Wednesday. have to extend that lunch hour Thank a little you. bit. What's your schedule, Kelly? I got to pray. <laughs> well, now, if, you ain't, if that's the only problem you got, then uh, uh, and by the way, I want you to know if my wife told you to me to tell your wife that she just liked to walk her legs off up here the other day. She ain't young enough to keep up with that woman of yours, that's running around here shopping, shopping around these stores, huh? <laughs> that's the reason I don't go shopping with her. I went one time. <laughs> Jack, what's your situation? I got work to do when I can get back. It'll be waiting for me. It'll we might the delay lunch then. <laughs> we might delay lunch if we're lucky. Uh, you know. We, we can talk, talk and eat at the same time. Well, we, we're doing a lot of unnecessary <laughs> talking now. Let's get on with the with a couple of things we we uh, we got out here to talk about. I'm gonna I'm gonna scratch affiliation problem. We'll take this up at the board I'm meeting. I'm getting tired of talking about it. And every time, you, know, you want to hold off the convention item till the board meeting? Yeah, that's all right. All right. I'll scratch that off of this meeting. <clears throat> How about the committee to study the Constitution? Anybody, you want to take that up now? You want to delay that for the next meeting? Anybody got any ideas about we should. who should be on that committee? We shouldn't spend a lot of time on that. I'd make a motion that the president be authorized to appoint a study committee of the Constitution. 
Uh, I've been authorized to do that by the convention. That's already been authorized by the convention. I just want some ideas from this committee about how I ought to go about appointing this committee. <laughs> Whether I should select them all from a Jackson area, make it convenient for them to meet, or will I should try to set something up uh, from people from around the state. And if you got any ideas about uh, how this Constitution ought to be restructured, the first thing that I intend to do is to get copies of the Constitution of all the state organizations that will mail them to me for them to have in hand. And there's nothing urgent about this. We've got a two-year period for them to work in. But uh, maybe you guys just ought to be thinking about a few things about this. Uh, let me throw you a couple of things out for consideration as to whether or not you think the committee ought to consider. For instance, there's a feeling on the part of a lot of people that anybody serving on the board of this state organization that that local union ought to be affiliated at both the central body level and the state level. Certainly they can't be a board member without being affiliated with this organization. But we got a couple of requirements. He has to, for instance, Tom and myself have to maintain our membership in our own local union or in a local union affiliated. That applies to a board member as well. All right. Now, there's a lot of feeling out there and we're for with these central bodies uh, that we've got two or three board members serving now that do not participate at the central body level. In several cases, the locals are not affiliated with the Central Labor Council. And there's a feeling on the part of a lot of those people that this is not right that a man or his local ought to be affiliated with both organizations. And, and to a certain point, they're correct because a lot of our program is dependent upon the, the activity and the success at the local central body level. There's a feeling on the part of some of these central body people that they ought to even designate a member from their central body here to serve on this board. You might, I'm not asking you for a decision on this now, but I'm just asking you to give these matters some thought because there is a certain amount of merit to it. And if it's worked correctly, in line with some things that are being done in other states, whereby the state organization does not pay the expenses of board members, the expenses are paid by the central body instead of the state organization. If they're allowed to name board members, see, themselves, they have to first have a certain number of people affiliated with their organization and with our organization. Then after another figure is reached, they allow another board member, you see, which means affiliation at both ends. But they pick up the expenses of the board member. You see? Now this would add an addition, additional incentive for people, for them to work on the affiliation thing at both ends, the local level and at the state level, if they knew that they were going to be able to themselves elect members to serve on this board. You follow me? Now I'm going to give you a couple examples of what we got. One of them, or two of them, involves two of our black board members. One of them is Bob Woodson here in Jackson, who uh, was the first black to be put on the board, affiliated with the state organization. Yet his local union is never affiliated with the Jackson Central Labor Council. Just about everybody else in the area is. And a lot of the doggone people in the Jackson area have expressed to me uh, the fact that if this local union doesn't affiliate with that so local central body, they're not going to support Bob Woodson for re-election. The same thing applies in Harrison County, 
Well, we have Herbert Williams on the board, who has been of very little assistance to our local central body down there in conducting their programs, and there's some hard feelings about that, you know. And it's not just the two blacks. We've got two or three other people that fill the same category. So be thinking about these things a little bit, you know, before our next board meeting. Now, it would save us a lot of money, and you can see what, what how costly a convention is after you look the figures over. <coughs> if we could work out an arrangement where the central bodies, I would suggest that this would be with the board and not the executive committee. You know, and you might make that number on the board flexible. We'll say in order to have a board member, for them to name one, We'd have to sit down and do a little figuring. 1,500, 2,000 members to qualify for a board member for them to name a board member. Then after they reach another figure, we'll say four or 5,000, they would be entitled to the second board member. Follow me? Now then we'd have to, in order to complete the thing, have a certain number of board members elected at large. If we had central bodies that couldn't qualify, then I don't see anything too much wrong with the way we we uh, select the executive committee itself. Uh, and now, if we do the thing that I'm talking about at the central body level, that restriction on the number of people on the board from a certain international union would probably have to be removed as far as board members concerned. I would think it would probably, you'd probably want to keep it as far as the executive committee is concerned. I'm just throwing this out for you, food for thought now. Don't want no decision from you now. It's just something for you to be thinking about. Make some notes on this and chew on it when you get back home. And I want your views on before we set up the committee. I would suggest this as a starting point. Uh, procure a copy of the other right. uh, Constitution. And if we have lots of information own geographical areas, and I think we don't have to have a representative committee from the United States in order to deal with it. Uh -huh. If this is not a real factor in the other constitution, then maybe you can narrow it down for economic reasons. You're talking about the committee itself? The committee itself. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, y'all, I'll think about that. Y'all think about what I've thought out. Well, I know you don't want to discuss the, what you last said today, but I, I've got some thoughts on it. Uh, and part of what you said bothers me, and I'll tell you why it bothers me. I think if the state organization, uh, and of course you clarified to some degree by saying you, you wanted this to deal with only part of the board membership, our problem always has and probably always will be at the central body level. And we go through periods of having fairly active central bodies, and we go through periods when about half of them dies on the vine. Right. And the part that bothers me, if, we, if this organization sometime in the future is going to be the dependent to some degree on what the central bodies do, then it may also die on the vine. And uh, if you're going to do it strict solely from the, from the angle of having central bodies name a certain number of board members as long as they're all active and everybody's participating, this is fine. But when about half of them sort of dies, then, then what happens? This, this would well, concern there, there me. There wasn't just to begin with. I mean, this right. is my, just my view. Yeah. Because you know what the committee have come up with. Right. We set up the committee. They're going to be on their own. All I'm doing is expressing my own views on some things that, you know, I've talked right. to. I'm on this organization, the Super Duper Committee, Meany set up, and we have our own meetings. We discuss common problems. And I find out how they, some of these other states are operating. This is one of the things that Michigan does. Hell, they got a 40-member board, and they don't pay the expenses of anybody. Right. They've got regional directors and district directors and everybody else serving on their doggone board up there. They have a small convention when they have a board meeting, but it don't cost the state organization anything. See. Well, I'd be in favor of trying to spread the expenses out, but I wouldn't be in favor of putting finally the selection of a good majority of the board in the hands of central bodies that might not function. Well, at first, See? at first not <laughs> <to> function. <laughs> but first if they didn't, what do you do, Claude? Right. Then you go with what's left, which is less you than all. You elect them at large. <laughs> right. You elect them at large like we do now. Right. 
see? Right. It's just something food for thought. Right. It's just like we're trying to get the Natchez CLU reactivated. We're trying to get the Macomb Central Body. As a matter of fact, we got the charters for the two. And if they know, if they build that organization up, the way they say we, 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 we'll just use a round figure of 2,000, 3,000 people, that, uh, that there's a possibility of them being able to select a member of our board if they're affiliated both at the <coughs> central body and the state level. This might be an added incentive by help build the organization. That's the reason I'm throwing this out. Well, I mean, you, you get this argument about the uh, per capita tax law. Hell, we paying five different per capita tax right now. Did you know that? <laughs> you get into it. No That's question. right. We're paying the District A Council, the State Council, the CLU Council, and the Ladies Auxiliary, and the International. We're paying over $4 a month. That's why it's the most all organizations. Yeah, most of them got some other machinists than you and several other folks. Now we got to go to our own international begging to let us, we can't even open the Constitution and put a dues increase on. We got to go to the convention in September to convince them that we want to raise it to $10 a month. We had 11 a quarter. But they said, no, you can't do that anymore. But we're going to put it up to $10, $12 if we can. You mean the local can't raise the dues? No, sir. Not under our yeah, Constitution. on it, huh? Yes, sir. 675 well, I tell you what, if you get a $10, $12... That's in the, in the interaction. I'd, I'd, I'd like to be at your to. board meeting when you bring the matter up to raise your dues up to $12 a month. I'd sure like to hear that debate. We <laughs> <laughs> don't have well, any problem. Uh, we don't let it be debated. Yeah, I mean, we just you don't, don't let debate. it be debated. No, sir. You must have a real democratic organization now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Democracy is fine if you can afford it. <laughs> well, you got to have positive control. Right. <laughs> Guided democracy. Control the word. Positive control. All right. I just well, one wanna... final comment, right. and then I'll leave the subject. Uh, also, <coughs> I, I'm not sure, <coughs> even as an individual, and I'm not, I'm not even sure my organization would be. Uh, in favor of forcing local unions to affiliate with ever counts that develop in order to have uh, the right to run for office in this organization. We might leave out some awful good people because you get into these local situations uh, where if some particular guy is the president of the central body, then certain local just ain't going to affiliate during his term of office and so on that you just can't deal with from the state level. Sound like George Meany. No, but if we really force ever, if we if we force ever local to affiliate ever place, and you may leave out some good folks, it, you'll bar them from running for office. That's all that I'm saying. So 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 I have <laughs> give you some food for thought. <laughs> right. You see, how in the world these other locals don't get these people out of office if they just affiliate? Well, say you never get a power. Well, you know this matter of mandatory <laughs> affiliation. It's been a subject of discussion ever since I've been president of this organization at every state, every national convention I've ever attended. And uh, it was a subject at a recent uh, conference of state and local central bodies at Miami Beach, which I attended. And I told him that I wasn't too sure I was in favor of mandatory affiliation. That if we'd had mandatory affiliation in Mississippi back in the middle 1960s, that I didn't feel like there'd be many of the current officers still around. No, oh, because we, instead of staying in the organization trying to defeat the officers, they all pulled out of the organization. <laughs> and that's the only reason I'm still president. I feel like probably the only reason Tom Knight's still Secretary of Treasury. So I'm not too sure mandatory well, affiliation is answers all well, the problem. But, but you see, you see that same problem could develop, Claude, on having central bodies name their own board members. You could have a, a central body that was slanting in a certain way, just right. come plain out. You could have a central body infested with a clan. They could name somebody this board. None of us couldn't deal all with. All right, all right. But before if you you're going to lead it to them, and it's a localized situation. We've had it. You know it. All right, so but here, but here's what would have to be done. As you come up with something like this, the convention itself will have to, the Constitution would have to be rewritten in such a fashion that the convention would have, could exercise veto power over any such nominee. 
Yeah, but then you're not leaving to the central body. Well, they nominate them. Right. Oh, they can nominate them. They can nominate them now, Claude. All right, so what you what have you got now? All right, but here's what you've got now. I mean, looking at it from a practical point of view. You usually have caucuses of the different groups, and they usually get together on who they think ought to be on the board. Right. All right, the same thing can apply at the central body level. It would be generally understood if it's the local central body who wanted X person on the board, and they placed them in nomination, you know, this would pretty well be the way it would work out. The only problem we got now, and this this just comes back to a problem within Jack's organization, see, is that uh, the IBEW caucus decided they got three different groups within the organization. They got utilities, they got manufacturing, and they've got construction. So they themselves decided they wanted one member from each group, which eliminated one of our board members in Meridian, who is president of the Meridian Labor Council, right. L.D. Clark. You see, this is the type of thing that we're in. But, but you all just think about all this a little bit. But, Claude, if his own state organization didn't name him, I'm not sure they would to turn around and run him from the central body, see. His own international Well, he got out to this, you see. Right. Now, here's what he got out to. We, we, we just have to tell you what, what it got down to, because one of the guys that affected is sitting here. That's right. We had two people out of utilities. We had one vice president, Jack Schaefer, <laughs> and a board member, L.D. Clark, out of utilities in Meridian. Right, so somebody had to... Had so uh, uh, L.D. Clark wasn't about to take old Jack Schaefer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyhow, this is really not, it's really not the committee's business to decide these issues. But I am going to want your views on, on how we set up the committee. And then, then I'm going to, I'm going to carry a little bit further. I'm going to look for some direction from the committee on who they think ought to serve on this committee. I don't propose to arbitrarily appoint this committee on my own. I'm sure all of you write notes down on everything we're talking about here. Yeah. I ain't seen a pencil in action yet. <laughs> I won't have no trouble remembering all this. You remember all of this. All right. Let's leave that subject. <laughs> Let's take the labor school thing up, Tom, see if you've got a copy of this thing here. This is something we've got to begin action working on right away. We, we have already, before that resolution was adopted at the convention on the labor school thing, had already been talking with the people at the university about the possibility of another week-long labor institute over there this fall, thinking that our schedule would permit. And we have tentatively reserved the week of August 14th through the 18th for that date. That's when the facilities will be available. Lewis Ebersole, a, the guy that many of you know that helped us put on the workshops here a couple of years ago and then helped put on the training session over there. When was that, Tom? About two, three years ago we had that last one? Yeah, three years. All right. Uh, he's very much interested in working with us. And, of course, I briefly talked with the... Uh, Walter Davis, uh, I, the guy in charge of the FLCO Education Department, about this. And, of course, we had problems with George Guernsey and Ebersole, and George, he's bad about not communicating with people, getting everybody informed. We've had trouble with him on the Southern Labor School before with all of that. So I think we got, we got in other words, we're not going to burden you with all the problems, but uh, I talked to Walter about trying to work around George, maybe. But the items that have been listed, he sent us some suggested items to consider, uh, you know, for the school. You see, he's listed 16. This is many suggestions of uh, things that, that you might want to think about uh, as we might say the curriculum for the school. The resolution was sent in by one of my locals, very interested in uh, 
grievance procedure in arbitration. And uh, that is something that would put a well most all grievance procedure and arbitration procedures and most all of the space of the industrial unions more or less are the same. So I don't think we'd find ourselves in too much conflict with the procedure of any particular organization by general course on this. Are we in agreement on that? Right. I think it would be good in any view of the administration's position on the final offer arbitration. How about y'all taking time out of reading that list of 16 items there, if you haven't got a chance to read them yet? And there's any way you can hold a affected class on arbitration. I went five times the first year in office, and I swear one of them was a bit smaller than me. Well, <laughs> depends on what they arbitrate. And what well, no, what, what <laughs> Lewis has in mind, and we did a little of this role play in Venice in some of the workshops, because we didn't have time to follow through all the way on in, in these two or three night stops we had here a couple of years ago. But what he has in mind, and he, this guy has been on both sides of the bargaining table. He hasn't got arbitration. It's, uh, it's down here, though, Claude. Well, what you got? Shop steward. <laughs> he's got shop steward train, he's got collective bargaining, but the, the such arbitration per se, he don't list. And he has asked us about the ship. If he does, I don't see it. No, he hasn't got arbitration. Well, well, let's see. He got, what's he got on there? I mean, I, I looked at like close enough. Bargaining and stuff. Community services, labor economics, labor legislation, oil communications, current labor development. Training. All right, without well, tie that in. Don't say a thing about organizing the organized. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's got organizing techniques. Technique. Yeah, organized. Well, he needs to put organized. And all that organized. shop steward training. It could come on the shop steward training. But. Then let's let's put uh, let's add to that uh, grievance procedure and arbitration. Most of our groups, such as, well, let's see, the machinists have their own state association, IBW does, uh, you have your joint board, Jackson, do the rubber workers have any kind of a state organization? You have a regional set up, don't you? District. District, yeah. So anyhow, there's a lot of these subject matters here that you'd probably have on, uh, on your own if you wouldn't want involved in one of these institutes. Um, let's take a look now. I feel like that the grievance procedure and all the course on that arbitration thing, because that's in line with the resolution adopted. As a matter of fact, that's mandatory now that the convention acted on it, that that right. be part of it. Now, let's take a look at some of the other things that, that uh, you might want to... Uh, First, I think probably the best thing to do is start scratching things you think ought not to be on the thing. Right. Collective bargaining, of course, uh, should not be there because each one of the internationals and the local unions handle this matter as, as their own business, don't they? Yeah. Right. All right, scratch that one. Well, and it's so so different based on the right. industry you're in, and right. how much the way you could discuss it generally, I don't think. <laughs> All right. challenge the union members. That's a good subject. How are you going to scratch that one if you don't get into this Appalachian thing? Is that a community the bargaining? Yeah, no. He hasn't scratched two. community services no, I yet. I said that's a good oh. subject. Well, collective bargaining, either one. I mean, suppose you did bargaining on the individual basis. Yeah, but the collective bargaining role, as I view it, is, is one that's handled by far and large, by the different international unions and their locals. Right, it's handled uh, different each way. It would be most difficult, in my opinion, for us to set up a school on collective bargaining, which would run, you know, to fit everybody's uh, needs. I mean, you'd and have very few people out that would participate, too, see. This is another thing I'm thinking about. That, then that's when we, you part. see, you got your own school you put on. You've got certain things that you want to uh, indoctrinate or communicate with your own members on. 
Well, you wouldn't want that included in this particular school because you'll be handling that yourself. You're talking about a problem that only comes up once every three years, too. Time you some people on it, next time it comes up. Come on, collective bargaining. Yeah. Well, collective bargaining, even if you selected people, then they might not necessarily be the same people be involved in collective bargaining and uh, would be of no value until the fellow finally had about, a in. What about the community service thing, challenging union members? Mm -hmm. We, we want to leave that one, don't we? Yeah, All I right. think so. All right. About labor economics. Well, when you talk about labor economics and you talk about that labor legislation, it seems to me that labor legislation more or less covers it, don't it? I mean, you can't talk about legislation without you get into legislation affecting economics. Doesn't that kind of overlap? Well, we could time together. We talk about labor legislation. You, you're going to labor legislation and economics. Uh, well, the only problem with labor economics, it depends on who you got. Is the instructor, every one of them will give it to you different. Yeah, and you right. won't recognize neither one of them if you try to compare it later. Everybody's got their own slant on this. I don't know what you get out of a course like that, really. Well, let me ask you guys this. You want to try to make a decision on these items today, or you want to take this home study a little bit? Where is this going to be taught? Mississippi State University. We work out an arrangement with him over there for dormitory space and use of facilities. We've had one over there, and he worked out real good the last time. And we'll probably tie this in with uh, getting co-sponsored by the Southern Labor School as we, you know, and this will probably be our school and get away from this joint thing with some of the other states and just have an annual affair at Mississippi State University. How many people don't be allowed to keep? Well, of course, the locals will be will get an invitation out, and have all the affiliated organizations be allowed to send uh, whoever they want to send. Uh, hopefully, we we wouldn't want to put one on with less than say 40, 50 people. The last we, one over there, Russell, of course, Alabama participated with us. Gulf Coast Institute Southern Labor School. I think we had about 90 people, Mississippi and Alabama. Of course, we didn't do very much work on it, really. How many of these subjects can we select? This is the next question. Out of the 16, how many should we should we wind up? Well, with? keep in mind it's going to be a four-day thing. What I'd like for you to do is to scratch the ones that you don't think ought to be considered. And then let me sit down with, let us talk with Lewis and with Walter Davis, and let's see what we can come up with as a projected program. The ones that you don't think ought to be on the thing, uh, scratch them now. Why couldn't we combine labor economics and labor legislation? I think you could. I don't I've think that. Be, well, that was my thought. All right. I've got that Relations combined myself. Labor, right. Labor. Relations? Right. Well, couldn't you combine COPE activity in there with that? COPE activity? Yeah. We yeah. Labor right. economic, labor legislation, COPE right. activity, all in there. Put it all court. together? <laughs> I believe you could. All right. What about parliamentary law? Don't all of you teach your own parliamentary procedures? It'd only be good if you had some new presidents that would attend it. Other than that, I don't see that. What's your views on that? I think we ought to stretch that one. Organizing techniques, leave that up to the organizing department. Do we need one on that? No. no I'd say it'd be very little value at a school All where right. you had local delegates. It's probably Stretched never going to be involved in law. What about current labor developments? Backing up a little bit, the oil communication. We I think that's a must, really, if we don't have one. All right. Yeah, that's a good subject to leave in. Leave them in. What yeah, about French oil. benefits? That's yeah, what about oil communications? Are you putting that in or out? I'm putting that in with current labor developments. I think that uh, that's all part of it, isn't it? There's something else that needs to be tied together, more or less. Well, he's got he's got an overlap. He's got oral communications is five, and you got effective speaking is thirteen. Well, they're related. Uh, 
oral communication. He is speaking. I don't know why he's branching off in all these different directions. All right, so let me put a question by them, too, and tell them we think that uh, he has got that, so we'll get that worked out. Okay, all right. Uh, selling unionism, of course, is an everyday affair. What he means there was to sell it to one another, to sell it to somebody outside the labor movement. Well, well actually, uh, that's exactly. almost. Uh, I, I was yeah. Like that. One implication certainly is important. If we don't get something done in this area, we're going to all be out of business. Everybody agree and to that? Now that should be foreign trade implications. Yeah, labor. foreign imports, really, well, the word. <laughs> Foreign imports. Let's put imports. I don't know. I don't know what he means. Foreign implications to labor. He might be talking about uh, foreign imports. Something completely I'm different. Add the foreign, word imports. foreign imports. Foreign right. uh, implications to labor. Who who prepared this list? Who Professor Ebersole over at Mississippi State. Professor, Professor Ebersole. Yeah. He just lists uh, some items that he thought we. Well, might he want said to foreign consider. implication to labor. He's covering a whole subject. He might have. 19 different courses well, under that. Yeah. I mean, what you might tell him what course under there. I mean, Imports is that's like we say think. economics up here. If you yeah. went to college and studied economics, you know what he's talking about. My God, they got marketing and everything else that come yeah, under Yeah, and everybody will talk to you about it. It's got a different smell. Uh, well, like selling unionism. I mean, that, that covers so many, sir. I mean, yeah. that's what you're going to do up in community services as yeah. you sell it in union right. right. If you don't sell unionism, and if you want to get out of here in union, just going to like somebody, well, you're going to have to sell unionism. What about unionism this subject? What about this subject, public. modern union right. administration? <laughs> huh? What about this subject, modern union administration? There again, I don't know what he's talking about. Right. It's pretty you broad. Well, <laughs> <Right. laughs> so, sir, uh, what he's doing now, he's getting in the, into the duties of the international representative, the business agent. Well, in that well, that I doubt it. Now, very many different. Different folks say we better scratch. I'd that. scratch that if that's what he means, because right. each well, international well, I mean, got their own policy. He's talking about L. M. Forms and, and the uh, Taft Harley. And Maybe the, so. The, well, that's not modern. That was Taft Harley. It was 1947. Well, well the landing Griffin is relative modern, and L. M. Two Forms and all don't that. Don't you consider right? this part of the uh, duties of the international? Well, they might be in some locals. They don't ever come down to mine, and they they don't they 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 don't. We do our own. Between your international and local law, I mean, they do provide you with the necessary information. But see, you can get a better shape, brother Fly, on on LMs and 990s out of government agencies. Will send you people the instruction you can out of some professor that may not understand it uh, even as well as we do. No, I'm not talking about getting into how to fill them out. I'm just talking about modern uh, union administration. That a lot of people still have the idea of how the unions are run, like they were back in old old miners' days. Referred to. I guess I'll have to use the ladies' restroom. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you got light on there? Uh, no, one in no there? you take some effect of that. Yeah, you got so many different. You know, I didn't even automation. know the place was occupied. You slipped out on me. Yeah, I mean, you talking about economics, man. That covers so such a you broad field. Stay above, field. You about, yeah. Take one. Uh, well, I'll tell you I, what I, to I do. Modern Union Administration, unless you know more specifically what he's talking about. Why don't we? Why don't we do it this way? As soon as we get this broad picking legislature out of town, and we find a few days, we'll get Lewis over here, and uh, I'll try to set up a telephone conversation, uh, get Lewis in our office, and we'll get a get on the extensions over there with Walter Davis in Washington. Ask me and Tom sit down and talk with uh, Lewis and go over this thing along the lines we've been talking. We'll see what we can come up with a with a week long program covering the areas that uh, we've been talking about, and then we'll probably d send this out to you by mail, approval or disapproval for your thoughts. This would keep from having a meeting just to consider the thing. Would you like to handle it in that fashion? 
that'd be better. You certainly couldn't cover the 16 subjects he had no. listed in four no. days. No. Uh, well, of course, there's just no. some things to think about. That's all. That's you all this is. You, can't do you don't it water hand. it down somewhere. What's going to be the estimated expense of this week per Tom, you want to tell them about what uh, the cost is? Well, so we work, we work it out on this basis. Uh, they provide the room and the meals for a lump sum. Now, of course, we all know the cost of food, uh, despite Tricky Dick's uh, price freeze, goes up sometimes three and four times in one week. Um, as I recall, the last school over there, this included everything per person. Uh, and this was at least, I believe, two people, double occupancy, you know. Um, I think, I'm not sure, I think it was $90. Uh, and of course, we, we $90 eat in the cat. Yes, $90 but that per don't person. include you traveling a long time. Now, now let me tell you now, it, it, the same, same thing this time is going to be at least yeah, 105 or $10, I'm sure. For double, double occupancy and the food now, and I'm very critical of food. You know, all types of food. I'm very critical. Uh, but the food over there, I've been to these schools for the last 12 years, scattered around over the southeastern part of the country, and the food over there, meal after meal, day in day out, was the best we've ever had. I was really surprised. Cafeteria. We went right in with the students, you know. And uh, it, was, it was real good. <laughs> Might as well quit. Huh? It was <laughs> real good. But I would say, I would say it'd be at least hundred and five dollars a person for double offices. I could be off a little bit. You know, it'd be up to locals, you know, who they send and pay the cost of the uh, delegates. Of course, we'll. Through the national office, we'll provide the instructors and material and everything to the school. We've asked, we, we understand that uh, there's a new, a new, more moderate uh, dormitory over there. Now, the one that we were in before, uh, of course, was some that's constructed, uh, you know, years ago. And of course, you had about a half a dozen people using the same shower and everything as you would expect. But uh, we talked to them a little bit, and we need to talk to them a little more about this, Claude. I understand there's still newer, more modern lab yeah. dormitory space there, where there's yeah. not so many expected to use the same shower facilities, everything, hopefully. See, this is a slow season now. There's only just a small number in summer school. Hopefully, we can get these dormitory facilities changed to some of the newer, you know, places. If I can manage to get to, to replace Bob Edelman on the state college board, then uh, we'll see if we can get something more constructive worked out. What's the difference in the oil well, I'll really give you something to think about now, Evan. Did you know I had plans to get the governor to put me in uh, on the college board in place of Bob Edelman? <laughs> Your plans are what he does. Maybe two different times. <laughs> you guys, you guys didn't know I was planning on that, did you? <laughs> I was looking at another topic here. Don't hold your breath till this happens. Now. Impact of automation. Yeah. I don't know if, of course, this is good, but I don't know if it would be a priority item or not. Well, and the, again, each industry would be affected different, and I don't know how he'd cover the subject so that everybody there gets something out of it. Depends on what industry you're in. Why don't we, uh, why don't, why, why don't we just leave this thing like and a this? building trade probably couldn't care less about the automation at this point, even though it's hitting them to some degree. It's tearing them up now with these electricians, with these automated right. things. You'll right. see them, why a big building there. Right. Woo! Why don't you just but let, you, let if us, if they didn't cover uh, that, they'd get it over. Get Lewis over here, we'll try to sit down with him, and then we'll probably wind up calling him all at Davis in Washington. Uh, and they got a lot of stuff prepared, you know, to put the manuals and all together. And we've had a discussion with him. We will uh, then uh, put the thing together and send it back to you for your comments and consideration before we put it into effect in the final analysis. 
think this be the easiest way of Yeah, come change. up with what you think is or we ought to do, and then we can look at it rather than look at this. All right. <laughs> she done put her jacket back. Y'all got the cool one up? My toes. I got me while I'm out putting my dog on a coat on. Yeah, I'm warm coat. 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 Yeah, I'm
uh, from 22.5 to 25. When I found out what the committee uh, was going to recommend, and I went to work on a number of our friends over there, and had to consult him with a number of them, we decided that Senator Horton from Louisville, who was chairman of the Labor Committee, who was pretty well respected, and anyhow, I think this is the committee ought to have to be able to start with. He'd be the logical man to try to restore some of the, the uh, House pass parts of the bill in the, on the floor of the Senate. Well, they spent the better part of the day on this one, and this was the one, Jack, when we had this town you know, economic thing, as you and Tom know, and Tom stayed as long as he could and then had to leave, and then I stayed a little over with. And of course, all I got out of that meal out there was the salad and the dessert. I missed the main meal, but anyhow, I stayed a little all over with. But in final analysis, this is what we've got. Senator Horton was able to muster enough support in the Senate to restore the $7 increase in 74. The vote was 22 to 23. That's how close it was. Got the $73 back in the bill by a vote of 22 to 23. But the the maximum death benefit remains at $20,000. Now, they acted real fast, believe it or not. They realized the urgency of this matter, and, and it uh, kind of surprised me a little bit. Then the Purvis got up and asked for immediate release of this bill to the House. There's no objection. So they went straight to the House. When it got to the House, of course, it, the Senate amendments were rejected, and the House asked for conference. Uh, and this, this one really happened fast, because they already got the thing no quicker than, I mean, I checked, they got the House calendar, and by, bless Pat, yesterday, here it shows up on the conference committee. This is done overnight. <laughs> See? So uh, I talked with Ted Millett, Russell, chairman of the House Insurance Committee, and we've got a pretty good conference committee out of the House. We got him, Meredith, and Abrams, both from Washington County. Abrams and Meredith are both good friends, both are pro workman's comp lawyers. Don't think we've got any problems with the conferees in the House. I approached Senator Purvis yesterday to see who his conferees were. And he didn't even know the bill now had been put in conference. <laughs> this is how far behind he was. I said, well, it sh already shows up on the House calendar, and I showed him that it said, well, they, he said, well, I'll try to get around the point in the conferees then, uh, or at least the lieutenant governor will, and I'll let you know who they are uh, early part of next week. All right, so, so I've had a conference now with Ted Millett. And this is what I told Ted, that I felt the things that, that we needed out of the conference. I said, all right, you know, the House failed to lower the thing from eight to five. The Senate lowered it from eight to five. Both houses have passed the $56 weekly benefit amount and the $63 benefit amount. There's two main differences now in the two versions of the bill. One is the Senate has lowered the thing from eight to five and cut the total maximum benefit from 22.5 to 20. That's the two major changes. Both houses have voted on the increased benefit, which should be no problem, see? I told Ted that we would like to see the number lowered from eight to five, but if this was not a real, real crucial issue of us because we don't represent very many people with less than eight people. But it's a shame that it ought to be zero, really. Anybody ought to be, they ought to be compulsory across the board, regardless of the number of employees. But as far as we're concerned, and the conference, we wanted to see that maximum death benefit raised back up to 22.5.
if it means swapping off where this center, you know, the eight to five bit. Yeah. Get me? Yeah. So that's where we stand now. Does everybody agree with this approach? See, I find myself in a position over there that I've got to make decisions today, not tomorrow, and I haven't got time to confer with you guys. Oh, that's right. Now, your, your senators have come through good Bob, and so are the guys from the Gulf Coast. Yeah, Troy and us called me. Uh, well, you know, we had the Tuesday Senate hearing, and Wednesday some night. of your folks come up for the Senate hearing. Tuesday night, I guess, Wednesday was. But Troy did his he best. Did. I'll tell you about our experience with Chatham. Chatham done a thing on that. I'll tell yeah, you about right. Mr. Chatham. He was chairman of the subcommittee. But Chatham's in the insurance business. Well, he sold his insurance company. He used to be. Yeah. All right, so uh, we'll get this bill through the House. And I've already been, you know, we've had our hearing before the Senate. And I get to worry what the Senate's going to do, what they're going to recommend. They're going to, you know come out with their own substitute. So I'm over there one day, and I'm sitting down there talking with uh, Theodore Smith, and up walks in the Chatham, and I'm talking to Theodore about this particular piece of legislation. And Chatham walks up, and he says, you ain't even thanked me yet for uh, mm -hmm. bringing that cop bill out. And I didn't get a chance to say a word, and Theodore looked at him and said, why the hell should he? Said you ain't got it to bail. When I Theodore said this, I did. Yeah. So I let them hack a hassle for a while. Yeah. So I made just simply made a couple of inquiries as to why this was done, and of course they gave me all this malarkey about we'll be back next year, you know, and the year after, and all this stuff. But anyhow, uh, the senator from Hattiesburg, chairman of the subcommittee. His committee is the ones that, that uh, reduced the thing in the Senate subcommittee, which consequently was adopted by the full committee, which then were reported out on the floor of the Senate. And then at the end of it all, with a 23 to 22 vote, we got it back in the bell. And then the, I'll have to give Purvis credit for one thing. Uh, and I'll have to give Chatham credit also for this. At least they didn't oppose for immediate release to the house. At least they didn't do that. Right. So I had a conference with then with Senator Chatham, a little short conference with him after it was all over with, and, and uh, shook hands with him. And I said, well, you know, on second thought, I don't know if I ought to be shaking hands with you or not. After the way this thing is all out. Well, he says, uh, you know, we, we did the best we could. You'll have to admit we come out of with a pretty good bill. And he says, you'll also have to admit that I didn't fight real hard. I said, well, Senator, I will agree with those two points, that you didn't fight half as hard as you could have fought it. But I said, you know, that vote of 23 to 22 is pretty doggone close. Therefore, I'll give you credit for well, that 23 is 22 vote because if we fought just a little bit harder, we might have lost the bill. So I will give you that yeah. much credit. Did we ever find out, so here's something we need to know, did we ever find out what the vote was in the subcommittee? No. The three on that. No, I already you know. Storm or no candidates in Congress was on that subcommittee. No, we yeah. can't. They, that's a secret. They won't let that information out. Now, the other bill that we have an interest in. Well, how did Ingram vote on it? Oh, when it comes to the floor, we're well, I haven't got right part of the time wrong. <laughs> well, a lot of the votes over there were like, and again, huh? <laughs> well, now they they're pretty shrewd over there. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get a roll call vote or two. See, and the only roll call vote I was able to get was on the on the heart and amendment. Mm -hmm. I haven't picked it up yet, but we do have a roll call vote. It's so we'll be voting. able to tell, right? That's the only key vote we got. Heck, on final passage, it was unanimous. Yeah, well, it always so is. There's one time that Ingram voted right and there's one that voted wrong, but during all this debate, yeah. now, this, this was really a sight, you see. Here's the chairman of the full committee and the subcommittee standing up here, and they were standing there like a couple of lovers. When yeah. somebody else was speaking, here's Chatham and Purvis with their heads together. Yeah. While this is going on, Carol Ingram personally conferred with half of the members in the Senate. 
So I don't know what the heck he is trying to do. Don't know if he is. He comes up with one good one. Well, Ed, <laughs> let, let, me, let me tell you guys, those of you that are not, that are not too familiar with the way the legislature operates, and it's important that you understand that. And again, it comes back to some of the things we talked about before the makeup of the committees. And that legislation, this applies in both houses. When a committee comes out with a recommendation, automatically a large segment of either house feels they're obligated to support the committee's position. Now, this yeah. applies in not only here, but in the United States Congress. Yeah. So it's tough, man. It's real tough when you start bucking a committee in either house. And I'm telling you here today, we're very fortunate. And I'll have to give Eb Horton the credit for it from Louisville. Chairman of the Labor Committee for that 23 to 22 vote restoring that six to three dollars. You want my coat? No, it's turned off. All, my tools, my knife, all right. Now the other thing that we have a direct interest in, at least a lot of, a lot of you, you do, is the absentee ballot thing. The absentee ballot thing. We got everything we wanted in the bill in the house. Of course, we stressed the importance of all safeguards against fraud. All right, yesterday that was on the calendar for special consideration. They debated that one the better part of the day, and the Senate completely rewrote the bill. Series of amendments were adopted. I listened to part of the debate, wasn't able to get it all because we had one of our good senator friends running for the Congress who had to come over and help get some help and filling out his question there, and I was late to get over that, and I ain't gonna burden you with all of that. But they got a completely different version. That's now gonna go to conference. We don't know what we're gonna wind up with that. But uh, there is a lot of opposition in the Senate to do anything about absentee policy except for college kids and a couple of other people. And I've insisted all the way through, if we're going to do, any, do anything, we're going to amend the law at all. That anybody that's away from home because of his work on election day or in the hospital, you know, can't sure. get out to vote, should be allowed to cast an absentee ballot. That's been our position all the way through. And that's the House bill did the House bill did just this, and then the Senate come along and cut out some of the things put in the House, and this again goes to the conference. So we'll have to wait and see what's in the conference report. And of course, a conference report, as you know, I'm sure, cannot be amended. It's voted up or down. See? You either right. vote for it or you vote against it. It can't be amended on the floor. All right, so that's that's that. Now, Tom, I've got something down here for you to give them a report on the drug program. You want to give them a quick breakdown of well, where, where we stand with that one right here? Uh, we completely eliminated the other old program, that experimental thing. Uh, couldn't see him do anything with a guy named Grenada. Just wrote him a letter and canceled the thing. And uh, we've got uh, uh, program in Tupelo now. We've got two drug stores in Columbus. Another outfit we got a contract with is opening a new store in Macomb on May the 3rd. There'll be a new store open in Corinth in about six weeks. We've got that contract supposedly signed and on its way in. And uh, our big problem, of course, uh, Brother Sly down your area, we got a guy down there that wants to close him, but we ain't got nobody down there affiliated but your local. You got a program of your own, so that really puts us behind the eight ball. He's even called me up long distance. Won't be to Cheney. And uh, there's nobody down there else. Nobody's affiliated. And when he made the initial contact, you know who he addressed the letter to? He he had made the, the initial effort himself. He addressed the letter to Slim Hagelin and, and uh, uh, 
uh, the president of CWA can't call his name now. Hale. 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 Fre Ed, Hale. Ed Hale. Ed Hale. Dog on here is uh, Ed Hale's local and affiliate. So this is a real mess. I tried to talk to Cheney about it. I went down and me and him Slim uh, went down and talked to him. And of course, uh, you know, in fact, your local's got your own program. That's about and anything we do. I, uh, I told him, I says, we are, we are really in a bad way. We got certain rules and regulations about this program here. And it just happens that we've got a bad situation here in Nashville. And he called me up. Uh, you know, that hasn't been too long ago. And I told him, I said, well, we still got some problems down there. And I'm hoping we can work it out. And I kept hoping that maybe we'd get CWA uh, local. Uh, you know, we've got all their, you know, their locals, except well, that one in Gulf Coast. And, you and uh, frankly, I don't know. I'm at, national right away. I'm at uh, my role's in about the thing down there until we can do something one way or the other. We've got to get to the uh, local uh, affiliate before we can think about putting one up. Now. The remaining, the one remaining area where we don't have anything is what's known as Grenada. I met with a guy in Grenada the other afternoon whose name was handed to me during the convention. He's a nice fella. He's a real friend of ours. He's hopped to the hill. He's got the nicest drugstore in Grenada. And uh, he's, uh, he's, he's uh, between the brick and the heart. Business partner, a close friend of Jimmy Tillman over at Lewis, where we had this experiment. Jimmy Tillman got the heat put on him by the other merchants in Lewis, you see, and he backed off. And he don't even want to talk about the new program because uh, the business community comes down on him. Now he's already been on the phone with this guy in Grenada before I can get there. See. Yeah. Well, that's got him gun shot. Now. Yeah. So I'm going to get some of the local people to go talk to him. He, 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 he'll sign the contract in a minute if he figures that he can get by with it there. You know what I mean? When I begin to tell him the number of members we've got in the trade there, including Water Valley, Charles, and Winona, you know, I mean, he, he gets, he lights up like a Christmas tree. But yet and still, uh, he's hopped and he's obligated to the banks and everybody else. But I still, I, there's a man in Winona, one more. But I'm going to see you in the morning. I'm going there tomorrow to meet with the Congressional Interview Committee, and I'm going by there before we go in session and try him. Now, if we can get something through that part of the state, if we can get a little something going in Natchez, we'll have it put away. So, Who is the one in Grenada? Uh, Tom. Uh, uh, Thompson's Rexall uh, store on Old 51 <laughs> South in the uh, uh, Grady Green Shopping. It's just south of the intersection of 8 and 51. Man. He is an extremely nice fellow. Uh, very good friend of ours. He says, uh, contrary to what most of the people in this town think, I'm with you. And he says, I know your membership in the area has grown considerably, but he says, I do have my property. And I left the contract with him. I told him. How does your contract work? Uh, what, what well, it provides for the cost. It's based on the cost according to the druggist red book wholesale price, Bob, plus a professional fee. That fee only goes to a certain uh, up to $7.50. It allows a dollar and a half on top of that as a professional fee. And from that on, that dollar and a half is as big as that fee gets. Oh, at the bottom it says, or the regular selling price whenever less. So if they've got a selling price on an item that is less than that cost plus that fee that's set out in our contract, then the member with that card gets it for that less price, whatever the less price may be, see. Or for regular selling price whenever less. Bob, you hadn't been bothered in your office yet, have you? No. Well, before you leave town, we'll carry you over there and we'll, we'll pick up some of that stuff for you. And it provides, Bob, that each month, and incidentally, we got one man that's, that's, that's not complying with the contract, and I shall set him straight. Mr. Tudor in Meridian has not supplied us with the information. It requires that each month that we get a copy of all transactions, including the name of the customer, the prescription number, and the date and the price of that prescription. And everybody's complying with that but the gentleman in Meridian. 
and we can we've got a provision in there we can cancel that contract just like that if he violates it and that he is doing let me uh so i just wonder i mean uh let me, uh, it's kind let of me, hard for me to get my local involved. Well, in uh, your program is better than anything we come up with because the company pays for most of your medicine already. So we I mean this this we can't do anything to improve what you got. So no, we, I was just going to try to help him sell yeah. it in the Natchez area. Well, we got to get them affiliated first before they can yeah. be eligible. Now here's what we did, and we did this more or less on our own without uh, any authorization on the part of the executive committee because we get too much static flight from around the state. See, we started out with this one drug store in Jackson. We got, uh, I had my reservations about this when we did it. Uh, with this guy down here on Capitol Street. And of course, uh, since we had the one store and it was, a, it was a mail order deal and all that stuff, most of my locals just threw them cards in the can and forgot about them. And after several months, it Mr. Wackett, the contract provides that the, the purchaser shall right. exhibit right. this card when the purchase is being yeah. made. Now we've had we've had some some problems where in the person uh, did not show their card, and uh, some of the people it depends on who's on duty. You know, you got uh, you got all kinds of people. See, we've had some some uh, one or two instances where they uh, had some pretty rough things to say because the person did not show the card until they'd rung up the sale, you know, really. So, uh, pass the word around that it were, it were at all possible, please indicate to them that you do have the card before they ring the thing up because really we don't have much to stand on if, if the member don't show the card, you know what I mean. It, the contract said that they shall exhibit that card. But Do we have any co-op grocery stores, dry goods stores anywhere in Mississippi that you know of? No, the only well, one except one. some of the blacks, they've got to agree. No, I'm talking years, about labor. I years mean, ago, Masonite, Masonite Local had one down there, but it never, it, 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 they finally got out of it, yeah. and it didn't well, we pan didn't out. Try it. I don't well, know. let's... Uh, Masonite Local tried it. Let us work. get let us get this insurance thing on automobile worked out, and uh, if that's successful, we might want to think about something else. But to me, this automobile insurance thing offers the most promise of anything that I've seen yet. If it works out as it has in West Virginia, they've had one year's experience with it now. Uh, it's going to mean a tremendous savings to the union members and their families. And of course, I've got uh, the lawyer for the insurance uh, commission over here now studying the insurance laws to see what we can do and can't do to combine this to our membership. Uh, this thing is going to mean a saving depending on how many automobiles you've got, of course. Uh, anywhere from 100 to $150 a year. And after the thing is, is effective on top of the initial saving, each three months that one of our people drives wreck free there's an additional two percent knocked off on the premium on the premium. So let me ask a question, a question what we're talking about. Do you know anything about Dan Stone's background? Dan's about a pretty good son. Did he vote against the new shipyard? I hadn't even noticed you to ask that. I figured you were talking about Stone the Senator the other day when you catch it for the form. What? Didn't you say you helped one of the senators fill out his question? No, 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 it wasn't Ben. No, no, no this is Corbett Patrick. No. One of the uh, best guys over there, considering where he's from. Uh, did you know how he voted on that shipyard deal? The reason I say that, there's some people fighting about down in the shipyards about that sort of voted against your job, you know. And I told some people like. Lord, you're asking me a real good question now. I understand there's only one person in the whole state voted against it, and that was him. I don't think so. It's easy to check. We'll have to go back and check the, uh, this, this, I this know. thing. This, this is not this thing so. Happened. I want to be able to tell the people. I'll tell you, you, you what, he's not in the Senate yesterday. So they, when he's been a pretty good guy. He's been a pretty good guy. Boy, he lambasted the heck out of him for the, the, you know, the poor, 
watered down version of the yeah, Tea Valley thing. Remember Jackson Clarence Lidge this morning about the being watered down. Either. Ben's been a pretty good senator. I tell you what, you guys have got in the fifth, and we've been a that's the journey here for lunch in a minute, and I got two items left here, and then we ought to be able, you guys ought to be able to get out pretty pretty soon. We'll have lunch and then finish up. Uh, unless we get into a long extended debate. But, uh, see, we're going to have the meetings tomorrow, and here's what we, we've decided to do, that we'll have them all on the same day, and we've got to cotton picking many candidates, see. It's impossible interview these guys personally or we'd have to set up a week-long meeting to do it. So we decided to, to do the written questionnaire and mail them out to them and then have committees meet tomorrow to review the written questionnaire uh, and then make a recommendation to the meeting on the 29th as to what you feel like you want to do. And that's a, that's a, the situation that we're faced with and we've never had anything to compare with it yet in the history of the state, much less the history of this organization. <coughs> we've got three wide open congressional races, three incumbents stepping down. We've got anywhere from two to four good friendly guys in each race. We can go with. On top of that, we've got an outstanding man running against Jim Mason for the United States Senate. And we're busted. We don't have any money. That's what we're faced with. Now, I don't think that either caucus, any three caucuses, are going to be able to come out with a recommendation in the first primary because we uh, did we've got these friends. Too many people in the race. I think take the fifth for instance. You got Marvin Penton, who's one of our best friends in the house. You got Ben Stone from Harrison County, who's also a good guy. Then you got let's see who else you got in there. Judge Patterson. Judge from Patterson from Hattiesburg is a good guy. Well, you got you got uh, Bill Andrews who voted with us on the right to work bill years ago, and he's in the legislature. Of course, he hasn't been elected nothing since, but he was good for labor then. His so daddy was an IBEW member originally from the So you got so you got all local. these things to consider. No, <laughs> Marby Penton, <laughs> you see, Marby Penton has got every reason in the world to expect the Jackson County people in his in his county to support him. Ben Stone's got every reason in the world to expect his constituents, our folks in his county, to support him. See? And I don't know what James Jackson's going to God, do. I'm he here, here, here with, with, with Stone Barefield and oh, George Patterson. Oh, Stone Barefield. <laughs> Pardon my language. By the way, Stone, Stone, Stone hasn't way. returned a question. He probably that. won't. So that helps you out a little bit. But anyhow, we got still the same. He's Patterson and Frank Barber and even Mayor Grady, even though he's a Republican. He's better than some of the Democrats. So and, and well, you go Andrews. Going on through November, see? What? Yeah, whoever what wins is going to run three races. What about this Barber kid? <laughs> well, he's a good guy, except he's not quite stable. But let me, uh, <laughs> well, I no, mean, I, described I, him. No, I'm not kidding you. 12 o'clock. Twelve o'clock. You want to join the thing? Well, we got a problem down in our area to who to support. Yeah. Oh, I'm getting ready. To, I was going to tell you about all three of them. I just told you about you one. And you're in your, and your Pittman, district, Brown Pittman. <laughs> your district, you got Paul Pittman, you got Brown, you got Bodron. That's your three. Did Bodron finally qualify? I never did hear yeah. from you. Did he? Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. I just run into Brown a while with the just few months ago, and he know I had no question. All right. All right. Yeah, and you're motion. just... Oh, I told yeah, him, him last night. Yeah, made a motion. You're what? I told him last night. He ain't been <laughs> recognized for no motion. Well, I know it. I'm going to Well, you call my attention. He'd like to make a motion. That's right. Well, anyhow, we're not going to accept this motion yet. We're going to finish this discussion. So that's your situation. Now, How did Brown vote on the comp bill? Brown's been all right all the way. He's been all right. Brown, when you, if you could get him away from junking, he'd be by an outstanding legislator. He, 
He, on occasion, is reluctant to do what he would like to do because of, 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 of his fellow member of the legislature, the Speaker of the House. Anyhow, anyhow, this is what we've decided to do, and I ain't going to burden you with what we got in the, in the in the second district. We got a similar situation, all three of us. Now, this is what we we finally decided to do, and of course, I conferred with you guys and final analysis as to how we go about doing all of this in the absence of full-fledged convention. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do tomorrow. Tom is going to take the second district be there just to simply aid in the system, you know, as, as a representative of the state office. They're going to organize their own committee. They're going to elect themselves a chairman and a secretary. They're going to review the questionnaire. They're going to decide thing tomorrow. If I would be fully attended, the best approach to it was to use our machinery with the COPE committee, which involves our full executive board and the offices of the central body. Now, in addition to that, it's not limited to those people. If you've got anybody in your area that wants to come to this thing, by all means, let him come. He'd like to be here on the 29th, bring him. We are especially interested in having the international representatives and full-time business agents in this meeting. Because we're allowed to be calling on some of them to do some legwork between the first and second. You right? Know, me and all of my organization will be gone. And that's, you know, Can't I don't know how it works out. We already got a Did you have to think about it? I wouldn't know how it works. I thought we had sex the other day, Carl. Did you? And I promised that I said it was the main part of the way. I won't ever want one back. That's all. I'll loan you. One back. I'll loan you a knife. I'll show you how to open it sometime. I'll loan you a knife. If he's going to buy more, I'll give him the knife. I'll tell you what you do the next time. Kelly, and that's used to this fall, case. when I come back down there this fall, I go out and get the corn and all this oyster conversation. You bring your wife <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> we will now get back to serious business, having got all of the jokes out of the way. I want to uh, give you a brief rundown on the party situation that we have. Uh, here in the state as it relates to the national situation and turn as it relates to the conference we had in in Atlanta, Georgia, at which time uh, Al Barkin uh, made it known that the national AFL-CIO wanted uh, the uh, state organizations to try to get as many labor people elected to attend the National Democratic Convention as possible. Matter of fact, they shoot for 20 to 25 percent of the delegation to be from organized labor. And assured us that if we were able to get any of our people elected, that the expenses would be taken care of. So I've already just briefly went through with you some of the developments here at the state level. We decided there ain't but one sensible thing to do, and that's to work within the framework of the regular party structure. So we went to work, uh, as we have in the past, in trying to get as many people elected in the precinct meetings to the state convention, and we did have a sizable group of labor people at the thing. And I've told you about the first uh, round, what happened there. Then the fact the loyalists, uh, you know, <coughs> and uh, their demands. I mean, they just come up with an impossible uh, proposition as far as the governor and, and the five-member negotiating committee is concerned. You probably read about this. And uh, it was a standoff proposition. Of course, we had to be recessed and then reconvene the convention. The reports were made about where they stood. And the governor did a better job in that second round, I thought, Kelly, than he did in the first lead. I thought he offered some real positive leadership at this particular point. <laughs> so in the final analysis, we supported him and his position, and this infuriated the hell out of Mr. Henry, who was sitting as an observer, and uh, told me when I walked out, he said, well, you made your decision, you don't have to stick with it. I said, that's correct, <clears throat> you know, we shall be around when the main fight starts, that'll be in November. 
Since that time, I, uh, of course, got in to see the governor. As I told you, after all of the funny stories out of the way, I finally got in after everybody left about seven that night, just he and I. And I guess I spent about an hour with him, all told, talking about a number of things. But the main thing was I want to know, I told him, I said, I told him, I said, Bill, all I, I'm here for one damn reason only. I want to know what your game plan is as far as this party is concerned. It's time we got out of serious business. I said, now, uh, if you're serious in what you're saying, I want to know. If you're just out here saying these things to placate certain people, I want to know. Now, if you're really concerned about trying to put this state where it ought to be in the Democratic Party and to help elect the Democratic president, then we'll work day and night with you to bring this about. But I've got to know beyond the question of a doubt just where it is you want to go. I said, now, some people in this state's got damn short memories. And it, you might be one of them. And I said, maybe I ought to review with you a few things that's happened in this state in the last few years. I said, do you happen to recall that four years ago that Claude Ramsey managed the Humphrey Muskie campaign virtually? I thought he said I hadn't thought about it. I said, that's a damn trouble with all these folks around here. They, they got short memories. I said, I agreed to accept the position to help manage the Humphrey campaign as co-manager with Aaron Henry. And I said, had it not been for me and the state office, there'd have been damn little done in the campaign. That's number one. I said, number two, I think that probably the state FML CIO it's got about as big a stick when it comes to national affairs within the party as anybody around. That includes Mr. Henry and Mr. Evers and all these other phonies running around the state. Now I said, <clears throat> as far as I'm personally concerned, I'm ready to take the whole crowd on. There's nobody in this state, and you guys know this, there's nobody in the state that took any more abuse out of a certain element within the white community because of what we've done on the racial issue than I especially and Tom Knight. You know, now this is the record, the record that you speak for itself. So here we are today faced with a brand new ball game where yesterday, a few short years ago, we got the fight of our life with a white extremist to do what's right, as far as everybody's concerned. Four years ago, a deal was cut in advance to seat Aaron Henry and his delegation. And when we found out about it, we backed off and told them they had it. They still went to, I mean, that we were through with it. They went to the convention still telling a bunch of falsehoods that they had the support of the F of LCO, which was a damn lie because I wrote Henry a letter and I got it in my records now that we were through with it. See? Well, I, I don't, don't want to get into all that with you, but what I'm telling you is this, is that I told the governor of this state that if he's sincere in what he says he wants to do, if he wants to challenge Henry and his delegation and make a fight out of it before the Credentials Committee, I'm ready to lead the charge. Because I'm tired of having to see these phonies, you know, and this is what they are, they're phonies. They're not trying to do anything for them poor blacks out there. They've got their little thing of themselves. And Charlie Evers has made a miserable fortune, or it made a fortune, we'll say it, uh, at the expense of the blacks out there. And Aaron Henry's got a little taste of power, and he wants to hang on to it come hell or high water. He don't have a, he don't give a damn about the, what, you know, the progress of the state. This is what it's really getting down to. 
and I've got a stack of stuff in my office to back it all up. And I'm willing to go before the credentials committee myself and present the case for the party if, they, if they're interested in really wanting to do what's right. This is what I told the governor, see? And I told him further that, uh, that I'd be willing to sit down with his representatives and we would help work out a balanced delegation. I would expect a certain percent to come from labor and we'd have to put together a delegation that could be seated, at least be a representative group, black, white, women, and the whole works, you know. That I had my own connections in Washington, including some of the candidates for president. That the F of L CIO, I felt reasonably sure, would support our position once it become known. That there's going to be a lot riding on this thing other than Mississippi because there's been a big change in a lot of other southern states. And whether or not we elect a Democrat is, might just well depend on what happens in three or four southern states. And some of these southern states are going to be looking at Mississippi this time around. So it's not going to be as easy for Henry this time as it was four years ago. All right, so I have been in, in constant, constant consultation with the governor's right-hand man. I have had him in contact with our contacts in Washington, a gentleman by the name of Bob Keefe, who has been put on as the liaison man between the National Party and the FMLCIO. He's a former assistant to Senator Birch Bayer, who conducted the party reform hearing here a couple of years ago. And I've talked about it. And if we do things right, put it together along the lines of outline. And if we can get the message out soon enough for our folks, talking about the labor movement now in the big industrial states, and we've got our own connections up there, uh, there's a good change. The governor's sincere and they want to really do it right. We'll just take them on and get it over with. I'm ready to get this one behind us, you see. It means taking on these ponies, black and white. I say it's time right now that we draw the line. Let's get on with the damn job. Now, <clears throat> I would much prefer try to sit down and get something decent worked out in the line of a compromise. But based upon the attitude already exhibited by Aaron Henry and Patricia Daria, who we'll say we've got that little piece of paper and the governor's got to come to us on a bowed knee to get into that convention, I say to hell with it. And I told the governor that, I said, you remember you are the governor of the damn state and not Aaron Henry. And just because he's got that little piece of paper and they call it a convention, don't necessarily mean he's going to be seated because I got news for you, friend. They ain't got no damn party organization. They haven't had any precinct meetings. And damn it, I can expose them for what they really are if this is the route you want to go. Now, that's the kind of a conversation I had with the governor. And I told him about the same language as I'm telling you, by the way. So then me and Mr. McDonald have been talking. It's, in, it's still in a continuous talking stage. I've had a number of people indicate they want to go to the convention. Old Vic, uh, Casey Vic from Gulfport, would like to worry me to death up here the other day. But he wants to go to the convention. Well, now we got, you know, I told Vic, I said, hell, Vic, we, we got to get other things resolved before we start talking about a delegation to the convention, man. Anyhow, you passed 50 years old. We got House and Young faces, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, the whole thing gets down to this. Uh, a lot of these things, of course, you just have to take it on yourself and assume that you're going to have the support of your of the executive board and committee when it, when, when it all gets comes down to relic law. You don't have time to 
you know, get on the telephone, confer with everybody. When you get into one of these situations, you have to do the best you can with it. And uh, I'm fed up with it, you know. And it's so nice, uh, you know, he said at the convention, well, fine, well, I'm no Johnny come lately, neither is he, and neither is anybody else at this table. We were fighting the battle for the Democratic Party in this state before we ever heard of Aaron Henry. And it had it not been for the state AFL-CIO on several occasions in this state, this is back in the 60s, there wouldn't have been any campaign put on, friend. We were there before they were ever heard of. So we don't take a back seat to nobody in this end of the thing. Now, the only thing I want to know from you, do you agree with what I say? Are you ready to take on these phonies or not? It's going to either be this year or four years from now. I say do it now. That's right. And I say that our seven electoral votes might make the difference whether Nixon spends four more years in that White House or not. That's how close I think this election might be. Now, you are the, the group sitting at this table, as you know, you, you represent the, 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 the real guts of our organization, for a better expression. Final analysis, the decision will be made by the full board. I don't think you want to accept it on your own to make that decision, even though you can under the Constitution. But if you think I'm right, and what I've been doing, and if you think I should continue in this direction, I shall continue. If you think I'm not right, then I want to know now, and then I'll stop. But I just ain't willing to roll over and play dead. And I think it's time that we took these phonies on and exposed them for what they are, nothing but a bunch of phonies. Let me ask a question, Klaus. Uh, the uh, regular Democrats in the state, as I understand, has not elected, or possibly has not elected, an acceptable delegation. They haven't elected a full delegation from the state. They left a lot of slots open thinking they could get some kind of a compromise worked out. There's room enough on the slate to balance it out yet. Now, whose prerogative is it to select them? The State Democratic Executive Committee, this last convention, were authorized by convention action to work out the remainder of the delegation. And uh, I've told Sonny McDonald that if he can't get anything acceptable for worked out with Henry, and it's very apparent he can't, they've, they're, they're, they've got a hard position is that we, you know, we got the damn call, we got the credential, we complied with the commission's recommendation, and you guys can go to hell. Aaron Henry was quoted in the presidency, and the governor could go to hell for it, he is concerned. See? So there's no compromise in only a part. If we and went <coughs> before the uh, Credentials Committee All right. in Miami All right. with a group that uh, possibly would be selected yeah. from the regular, right. this is the only place that the case can be presented. Right. There'll be, a, there'll be, be a, a hearing before the Credentials Committee three weeks before the convention. Now, this is the thing from a practical, political point of view, and that's the way to look at it. And I told the governor, I said, now this business about filing a suit in federal court is for the birds. I said, it, uh, it might placate some of your right-wing constituency out there that's on your neck by some of the things you're doing, but from a practical point of view, this is not a legal question to be dealing with. It's going to be a political question in final analysis, see? And I told him, I said, now, let me give you something to think about. I said, number one is the role played by the National Air for CIO within the Democratic Party itself and the influence of the national organization. Another thing that you need to be made aware of is in the fight over the election of the chairman of the Credentials Committee, a black woman by the name of Mrs. Harris 
was elected with the support of the FFLCO. She'll be chairman of the Credentials Committee. Now, I said, I'm, I'd be the last person to suggest to you that we put together a delegation and send it to, to Miami to challenge Henry, and unless I put it well on you in advance, that number one, we had more than an even chance of being seated, or at least, the least we'd get out of it was a compromise whereby something would be worked out where, where both delegations would be seated and split the vote along the line you've already outlined. I would not want to be any part to helping you send the delegation of mine would be kicked out like the one was four years ago. See, I haven't left any question in his mind at all about this particular phase of it. Uh, I just don't think it's something that we can ignore. I think there's too much at stake in it all. I think the future not only of this state but of the nation might well be riding on the final outcome of this situation. And we just flat can't afford four more years of Richard Nixon, at least I, we can't afford it without a fight. I just ain't made that way. I can't roll over and play that in this kind of situation. Now, you want uh, me to continue? Uh, I don't, for my part, I don't. I'd make oh, a motion. To continue to, continue to, to negotiate. negotiate. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, well does the good. governor feel like he can support the Democrat Party once he gets to it? <laughs> well, he tells me. The reason I went in to see him, I want to know if he's sincere. Yeah, I get a feeling that once in a while that maybe some of you have because some of the stuff been going on and maybe... Yeah, he keeps hearing rumors. You know. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, maybe, 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 maybe that he's got some kind of a deal cut to throw the state into the Republican column. That's the reason I went in to see him. I well, want to know. Well, you should be prepared. I think you ought to continue, no question about that, but you ought to be prepared to get uh, cut out on that limb with him. I mean, to play it careful with him or uh, try to interpret what he's trying to do, which you can't second guess him. Well, I tell you. Yeah, you. me too. Well, I'll wait, let's come back to that part of it. Let's come back to that part of it, and this is important too, you see. You've got to remember a few things. The hand in his crowd just recently tried to get Eastman you might say kicked out of the party, denied of his seniority as a party member, stripped of his seniority, and they failed. Now, I don't have a thing in the world for Jim Eastland, and I hope before the day is over we, we take some positive action to support somebody against him. But there's a few things that we have to consider whether we like it or not. And that's the fact that even though we got a few Southern Democrats that don't consistently support the nominees of the party, things of that kind, at least when it comes to organizing the party machinery in the Congress, in both the Senate and the House, they vote with the Democrats in the organization process and therefore maintain control of the Committee of Science. Of course, we wind up with Eastland in the new process. But were this not the House, and they were to line up with the Republicans, and the Republicans were in control of the machinery, look where in the hell we'd be today. So you have to think about that part of it also, don't you understand? Uh, I don't see how we got any choice if you don't continue to try to get together with the governor and what he's doing, then we're going to have to take a back seat and not do either one. We sure can't go with Henry and what he's trying to do. That's for now. So right. either we go the route we're going or just sit on our hands. It looks to me like I don't think we can sit on our hands. Let me ask, let me inject something in there before we go. I think right. either this is a committee or an That's the only part. All right, all right. Let's tone for a minute. In the event, I think this is a question that maybe this committee ought to event that uh, Wallace, and I'm, I'm real worried now about whether or not he really knows what he's doing with this lawsuit business. 
uh, because, I mean, really, there's no court, there's no relief that can be uh, obtained in any party affairs that I know of in any court in this country. Now, this is literally stupid. All right. Now, if he continues to pursue this angle while he's doing it, everything's going to fall through. Another question I think that the committee needs to answer is if this should happen. Are we instructed to take the bull by the horn and get with the other, some other people in the regular, some Mississippians, and I'm talking about national Democrats, black and white, and put a delegation together and go down there that way. Forget the government. That's right. That's go what I'm talking about. If you get jumped yeah, I think you have to go, go down there to get to get the same route. You know, under the, with, with well, the right combination. We've talked about this, of course, and if we had a half a million dollars, I'd say that's the route to take. The cold facts of the matter, we don't have the money. If we had the money, I'd say, hell yes, that's the route to go. It's just simply a matter of not having money enough to do it this way. But I'm convinced, you see, I haven't talked with just Sonny MacDonald, the governor's right-hand man. I've been talking with other members of the regular Democratic Executive Committee. And we got some good people. And I've talked with quite a few members of the legislature who themselves are with us. And you, you, should, be, you should be happy over this. Uh, I'm happy because I'm just your, your spokesman, your elected representative. But I've had them all tell me, if there's anybody in this state can put it together, by God, you're the person. That's what they tell me. Frank Barber said that in the office over the cup of coffee the other day. He recognizes this. If there's anybody around that can pull this thing together, it's you and organized labor. Without you, it can't be done. That's what they all tell me. George Rogers from Vicksburg told me the same thing. I mean, uh, uh, if we get into this, what is the black situation? I mean, are they going to follow Henry, the majority? No. Henry can't muster. He couldn't elect the dog catcher right now. He's in bad disrepute with a lot of most of the blacks now. Yes, sir. It's, uh, the only thing about it, and I must tell you the whole truth, the whole thing. Some of the blacks have a sense of obligation to Ian Henry because they think he's put up a battle in their behalf in the years in the past and they're reluctant to dump it. See? Yet at the same time, they're fed up with this game play. Now let me tell you one of the main sources of my contact and information within the regular is Clee McDowell, the black member of the regular executive committee. See, he's the second black enrolled in Ole Miss. He's young, he's articulate, he's intelligent. He's been in my office, we've drank coffee, we've talked about the overall problem. And he's fed up with Fannie Lou Hamer, with Charles Evers, and with Aaron Henry. And he's done it this damn time. I'm sorry, Miss Phillips. We yeah. should have asked you to leave before I got really wound up. No, she told me she's filing up the record. Well, I'm filing up the record beating on the table. Too loud and too loud. All right. She won't be in the recording. My volume really, oh. really rises on this subject. <laughs> I realize that. No, no. But uh, anyhow, Cleve Mike Dow is ready. Now here you see here you, you see he's had you know, you know when I say Fannie Lou I don't have yeah. to tell you you don't have your expenses with her. He's done had his battles with the phonies. He knows who they are, and he says it's time for the responsible blacks in this state to sit down and start getting what they can while we have a decent white gut. That's his attitude, and he's correct. Well, I agree with that. All right. 
then we've had a meeting of our black labor leaders who intend to organize an A. Philip Randolph Institute here in the state. We've already had one meeting. And we're going to insist that they be get out here and start providing the proper kind of leadership and expose these phones. Now, if we handle it right, you see, we'll have the support of people like Cleve Mike Dow. And I think Cleve Mike Dowell himself would be willing to go before that credentials committee and testify. Now, I'm not, you know, uh, I've got a pretty good reputation as a pretty good poker player, you know. And I'm not used to throwing my money in the pot out there unless I think I've got a pretty good chance of winning. And if we get involved in this thing, I'm going to know pretty well how the cards stack up before we even make the first move. That's what I'm telling you. But it's serious business. And I'm tired of this stuff, as a lot of you are, I'm sure. And it's about time we put the whole thing in its proper perspective. And, you know, I, I'm going to, four years from now, I'm going to be four years old. And I'd like to see this thing in its proper perspective before I'm four years old. And some of you guys sitting around this table are just about as old as I am. Only well, got one young man on this committee sitting there in the table. Says <laughs> Reuben Anderson has played any part in Hines County. Reuben Anderson is sick for the gills of the whole world. I run into him in the post office here a while back, and he just held up his hand. He don't know what's going on. He's disgusted with the whole business. <laughs> he would be a pretty good boy to get to his camp, in my opinion. Very fine man. But again, you've got this cotton-picking situation to deal with, and I ain't black, see? I guess I need to get a little charcoal on my face or something so I can take on some of them with a, have a dark skin. But for some reason unknown to me, some of these blacks are reluctant to take on another black, even though they know he's phony. They'll sit on in my office and tell me a minute. They know that, that Evers is a phony, that he's making a fortune at the expense of his own people. He's a black George Wallace. He's made a couple of million dollars as running for governor of this state. But you think they'd get out here publicly and take him on? <laughs> they won't do it. The hell with them all. I don't color, as far as color is concerned. You know, and I think I'm right. I think it's time to say we're right. It's time right now, I think, to stand up and be counted. That's the way I feel about it. You, and, and you guys, uh, two of you at least, uh, there's only two members of the committee now. I wasn't around four years ago uh, when we made that decision that I would uh, that I'd manage the campaign, co-manage it with Henry. Some people thought I'd went off my rocker at that time, but I still think it was a wise decision to make. I'm not, I don't have any regrets over it because at that point we couldn't afford to turn it over and let it become an all-black outfit. There had to be some white identification. Now we've got a record to point to, you know? We've got a record. And if, if Henry wants to fight, like I told Charles Evers, I sent Evers word when he's making speeches around the state and he's going to run over to state AFLC on Claude Rams in the governor's race. I sent him word. I said, no, I don't know what this is all about, friend. And I still don't understand it. I sent him word by a mutual friend who's black. I said, no, I don't know what this is. This is Charles Young in Meridian, who's a good Democrat. I said, Charles, I don't understand this, what this is all about. I don't know what Evers is up to. But I said, I got a message for him. You said, you'll be seeing him tomorrow, won't you? He's going to nominate him for governor. And he's tore up because this crap about the book had just come out. Yeah. And he's all tore up, you know, about his hustling and activity. Yeah. I said, well, you got my deepest sympathy, Charles, but I said, now that we're on the subject, I, I got a message for you to carry that SOB for me. I said, what is it? I said, I want you to tell him that I said, 
I've been getting reports about his speeches, about what he's going to do. I don't understand it. I'm not looking for a fight with him. But if that's what he wants, if he's looking for a fight, he's damn well coming to the right place. Because I haven't run from one yet. I damn sure won't run from one with him. You tell him I said that. He made the more speeches. He said he got the more reports. You know, the only thing that, that makes it look hey, we beat him is the fact that the first meeting we had in the closet, you know, he, had, he didn't even make a stand. He got up and made one of his political speeches. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the second time, yeah. the second convention, he made a stand. That's right. Uh, there was a couple hundred people there, you know. It's going to kind of be hard for him to back down off of some of that stuff he said. That's correct. Could. That's correct. True. And, uh, I went to see him. He's going to be in hot water if he backs down. He's getting some terrible school advice. Yeah. Terrible. Now, well, there was a 100% improvement over that first convention we attended when he didn't even make a stand here on nothing, you know. Well, some people told me, and, and, uh, and you were there, and he was especially a couple of newsmen in town. He said, well, you saved them. Been a few of the whole thing went down the drain. It's that substitute motion. <coughs> I said, well, that, this might be correct. Somebody else might eventually offer the motion, but I said, I've been in this business for a while myself. I said, you guys have got short memories. You've, got, you, 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 you've already forgot about what the hell we done four years ago. I said, we didn't get into this game yesterday. We're not amateurs at it, you know. But anyhow, I agree with you, Kelly. The governor did. There was a big change. Very positive leadership in the second round. That's the reason I went to see him, to see if he is sincere. So if it's all right with you guys, I shall continue. Maybe we'll have something constructive to report on the 29th. We've got to know pretty soon because I've got to go to work at, at the national level. I've got to let our folks in the other 49 states know what the game is. We've got to get them lined up behind us if we have to take them on this credentials committee. You understand? And this is what I've been trying to tell Sonny McDonald. You see, the problem in this thing, fellas, is this. Bill Dollar, I think Waller, is a decent guy. Basically, I think he's a decent guy wanting to do the right thing. But the problem is simply this. Bill Wallace never has been in state government before. We elected a man governor once again that has had no experience in state government. He's got a bunch of amateurs around that's never had any experience in these things. Sonny McDonald is a good guy. But Sonny McDonald has never had any experience in dealing with these problems. Don't you understand? This is probably the first precinct he didn't know they even had one prior to this year. Well, now, if there's no objection on your part, I shall continue. It won't be necessary to put it to a vote. Is it, is, is it agreeable that I shall continue? Yep. Any, any objections? Ma'am? <laughs> the motion has already been made yeah. that you continue. continue the negotiations. I never did recognize anybody with such a motion who offered the motion. <laughs> I did, but I think you were talking. It, you put it in. <laughs> I shall now recognize you for the motion. We move the, I move the continue the negotiations. You get a second? Second. Yeah, we'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried so on. And I'm gonna we're now gonna move down to the senatorial thing. So hey, for the record, better read this letter that went to the candidates for Senate just in case yes. somebody's gonna ask. We're gonna let Mr. Knight check up the senatorial thing. You know, somebody's gonna ask if Jim is gonna send in a questionnaire if he was notified. This and all of you got copies of the questionnaire, right? This letter yeah. went to James O. Eastland, Dodgeville, Mississippi, on April tenth. Dear sir. Closed is a questionnaire prepared especially for the 1972 Mississippi Senatorial election. Prompt response. Sincerely, Thomas Knight, Director of Political Education. That went to all of them. So, 
we received a questionnaire filled out by Honorable Lewis Fonder, State Representative in Jackson County, Honorable Taylor Webb, Attorney of Leland, Mississippi. Now you have copies of the questionnaire. Well, I've got Fondren on top, so if you want to, we'll read the, the question and then I'll give you the answer. And if you'd like to make some notes, uh, I've got. Yeah, let me know. just give each of you one of these evaluation yeah. sheets here that we use to, in these matters, and uh, you can go from there. Just get you one and pass them on. Can't use them to. And of course, I might add while I'm on the subject that letters similar to that, just minor changes went to each candidate for Congress along with it. And you will have a copy of that tomorrow in each of your district meetings. This is Lewis Fonder. <coughs> Number one, do you support the right of labor to organize and bargain collectively as spelled out in the National Labor Relations Act? His answer is yes. Number two. It is a well-known fact that a person's earning power is largely dependent upon his or her level of education. Even though Mississippi is currently spending approximately 60% of her tax dollars on education, a large number of our state's population is still undereducated to the point that they cannot qualify for a job paying a decent wage. Many educators have expressed belief that the federal government must be again paying a larger share of all educational costs if our children are to truly receive a quality education and become productive citizens. What are your views on this subject? Answer, my opinion is, the, is that the goal ideally is for all children to have an equal and adequately funded education program. The federal court decision in California and the decisions now following are in correct. Are correct in that they point out the vast discrepancies existing in educational opportunities from school district to school district. I favor a federal program that could close this gap and the gap existing between states. Read both answers after each question. Uh -huh. I thought you were going to read your question marks and then both answers. No, we got to take one as we, that's the way we've always done it before one candidate at a time, haven't we? Hmm? Yeah. Well, compare. Why do you want to read the question twice? Don't make any difference to me. We're only down to, through the second question. You know, you want to well, take it. You could do, you could just read it. Might be save a little time. Yeah, right. Read, read both of them. Right. Well, like go. Some, some, some some they say you read right. the question over. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. I stand correct. All right. Okay. That eight or ten would be difficult. Right. But the two would be right. okay. All right. Let's go back to the first question. Give this, the the th this is well. I have not read the NLRA in its entirety, but I recognize and will support the right of the working people to organize and bargain collectively. Well, way up. well, Fondren's answer to that was just a yes. Okay, now, answer to number two, which uh, from Webb, which I just read, Fondren. See remark, see marked excerpts in attached speech, which was made before I decided to enter politics. My position has not changed, and he has attached his address as president of the Mississippi Economic Council. Uh, to the convention of that organization. Now, see, this is a considerable document here, and uh, he has, I guess, there's nothing to do but read this because it, it, well, it won't take a few minutes. It might, it might save a little time. Everybody, Just a minute if I can pick he out was on our convention program two years mm -hmm. ago, which was a kind of a landmark situation in itself, and the reason we invited him because of some of his progressive uh, remarks and attitudes expressed uh, publicly. 
time an unusual thing, Bob, for the state FLC. I ought to have invited the president of the state MEC to dress it. Yeah, dress it. But nevertheless, that was the reason for it, and he has got some progressive ideas. And and uh, <coughs> I'm trying to pick out some talking about that. What he's saying. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's go on uh, to the next question. That is linked. Okay, the next question is, Mississippi's in dire need of additional blue chip industry. If elected to, it says Congress, it should have been changed to Senate. Would you use the influence of the office to help secure industry of this type? Fund it. Yes, I might point out that during my political life, I have maintained Ralph Fort, Ralph, Ralph Fort, Ralph with all interest in our private and public sectors. That is uh, fun. The answer to that question on well, yes, the marked excerpts and attached speech. My position has <laughs> not changed. But uh, I'm sure all of us that attended the convention in 70 will remember uh, that he, he dealt with this subject and again. Uh, this, uh, he, he talks about this. Uh, well, that's length. been one of his themes is the need to get a high wage energy in the state. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, I, I don't blame him for using that for an answer because this goes back and shows you he's just not putting down an answer if you want. He's going out. That's what he's been saying prior. Right. right. He, he emphasized <laughs> the fact <laughs> this was made Earth before enough. he thought about running for public office. Okay, question number four. There is an alarming increase in the number of imports coming into this country daily from sweatshops abroad. Many of these shops are built and operated by American corporations, and the lucrative profits are tax-free in this country. These imports fund me. Yes, I would work for and vote for reasonable equalizing tariffs and study other means of correction. Well. Well, I am committed to tax reform. I am not committed to undue restrictions on imports, but protective measures are in order. Number five, would you support or oppose legislation imposing a so-called federal open shop law on organized labor? Funding, I would oppose such a law because I believe that it would probably throw the weight of federal authority to management, at least under the present law. There is some balance of power between management and labor. Well, I am not committed to any particular labor legislation except as to individual workers. I presently believe he or she should have the right to join or not join a union. You think so? That makes so good. It's so hot. Matter of fact, you'd be no surprised you'd open shop. But well, he understood it. He understood it because he answered it, but he yeah. I put out his answer as yeah. no. <clears throat> All right, number six. Would you vote for or against legislation placing labor unions under antitrust law? Funding. I would vote against such legislation. Well, Although I firmly believe in strong, effective, and responsive government, business, and labor unions at the state and local level, I am greatly concerned with the bigness of government, corporate conglomerates, and labor unions at the centralized national level. I will do whatever is necessary at the federal level to make big government, big business, and big unions more responsive to the needs of average citizens. Ain't sure on that one ain't so good either. All right, number seven. With the cost of medical service on the increase, the average worker are hard pressed to provide adequate health care for themselves and their families. Would you support legislation providing a national health insurance program, such as the one introduced last year by Senator Kennedy and Congresswoman Griffith? Funded. Yes. I would also study and give consideration to applying stronger 
price controls in this field as well as other fields. That is, controls over the price of drugs and other medical care. I only have a general knowledge of this bill, so I am speaking in theory only and might differ in some detail. Well, I have not read the health insurance legislation introduced last year by Senator Kennedy and Congresswoman Griffin, and therefore I cannot commit myself. I would be less than human, however, if I was not concerned with health needs of all Americans. I am concerned with with their health needs. So he didn't say if he is for it or against no. it. All right, number eight. There is a great need for tax reform in this question mark by the Congress of the United States. The Nixon administration re recently granted tax relief to the corporations of this country. <laughs> it is well known fact that many wealthy people pay no tax and many others do not pay their fair share. Even though the Nixon administration constantly talks about fairness, the national sales tax. Fund, I would vote against the national sales tax. Mississippians are already heavily loaded with taxes on necessities. I'm in favor of larger exemptions from federal income tax for the ordinary citizen. Well, I am almost certain I would vote against the value-added tax. I know I would unless and until such times as there are drastic reforms in present tax laws and welfare laws. Yeah, that's at least he finally come up with a fraud at his last <coughs> one. He did on that one, on market location. Number nine, efforts at the state level to improve workman's compensation insurance and unemployment compensation have not adequately met the <laughs> workers' needs. Would you favor legislation establishing federal minimum standards in order that these laws might be more responsive to the needs of injured and unemployed workers? Sponsoring, yes, as long as the minimum was reasonable. Well, I doubt if I would because I believe it would be more beneficial in Mississippi broke the power of the state special interest groups and required state government to assume and fulfill its responsibility. In other words, he voted against federal legislation. He don't know what we're talking about, does he? Well, he, he didn't understand it quite well, but just don't share our philosophy. Number 10, <clears throat> the cost of adequate auto insurance is almost beyond the average worker's ability to pay. Would you support legislation designed to correct this situation? Specifically, would you support legislation to provide for a national no-fault insurance law? Yes, by stronger price control as well as by national no-fault insurance. That's fun. At this time, I do not know, but I would carefully consider it. Although I am an attorney, my decision would be based on what's best for the people and not the lawyers or insurance companies. Yeah, I don't know. He really ain't sure. You know, he might really be giving the may not, depending on the turn of the bill, but yeah. I'm sure we'll have some discussion when we get through with the answers. I'm gonna put question okay. mark those uh, it's hard yeah, in a situation done. like this. Wait, wait just a minute. Now on the auto insurance thing. Well, wait a minute. Now. Let me just back up and read his answer. The whole thing. At this time, I do not know, but I would carefully consider it. Although I am an attorney, my decision would be based on what's best for the people and not the lawyers or insurance companies ultimately benefiting employer, employee, and consumer. My answer is more directed at the acute situation in Mississippi than the national scene. I intend to be involved in Mississippi's economic development. Now that don't quite, but it, it's certainly on the I next page. I don't know how that fits no fault insurance. And it it's, uh, continues as the answer to number 10. You really jammed it up. Okay, number 11. The president's so-called wish would you vote for legislation increasing the minimum wage to at least $2 per hour? Fund. 
yet with some exceptions given for temporary student laborers who are on vacation jobs. Well, I am deeply concerned with the conflicts between labor and management and the widening gap between the extremely wealthy and middle and lower income Americans and Mississippians in particular. I am not convinced a government imposed minimum wage of $2 per hour is the answer. I believe the answer lies more in the direction of better trained and better educated labor and more productive labor thereby. Oh yeah, now, boy, he has really messed this thing up. All right, now, I read you some, God, we go back now to what I read a while ago. He has really miss, messed this thing up. You can allow him another page. We told him to use separate keys. Or, places. you know. Uh, He's answering it pretty well. He Wait said he wouldn't now, vote let, for let, it. Let me see. Now, <laughs> I thought was part of his answer to the automobile insurance thing, which was really part of the answer to this. And he, he was up. Uh, all right, let's see. <laughs> I am... Um, all right, I'll have to read this again now and try to connect it together. I am deeply concerned with the conflicts between labor and management and the widening gap between the extremely wealthy and middle and lower income Americans and Mississippians in particular. I am not convinced a government imposed minimum wage of $2 per hour is the answer. I believe the answer lies more in the direction of better trained and educated labor and more productive labor, thereby ultimately benefiting employer, employee, and consumer. My answer is more directed at the acute situation in Mississippi than the national scene. I intend to be involved in Mississippi's economic development. Now that that I thought that we thought was part of the answer to number 10 was really part of the answer to this one. What he's thought. saying is that he'd vote against the minimum wage bill and that people ought to work harder and he, that they'd make more money. He, well, he, he can't seem to connect the state with the federal thing in yeah. this situation. You know, I, mean, boy, I, I understand you, him I, pretty well. Mm -hmm. well you mm -hmm. know, Where are we now? I'm mixed up. Now. Starting with number 12. number 12. Do you support labor's right to participate fully in the political process? Pondering, yes. Well, yes, the same as other organizations do, but it is a better situation when the member becomes personally involved in the political process instead of abdicating that responsibility. Yeah, in other words, he don't want the leaders doing it. <laughs> they were best. Okay, number 13. <laughs> I get too fast for you. Oh, no, go ahead. Boy, this, this mess he made me is not easy to follow, I don't think. Number 13, do you subscribe to the principles of the National Democratic Party? Will you support the party nominees for president and vice president? Pondering. Generally, yes. At this time, I do not plan on any active participation in the presidential or vice presidential race. Well, I subscribe to some principles of the National Democratic Party, but not all. I am more concerned with people than parties or systems. I will not at this time commit myself to support the nominees of any party until I see who they are and what they stand for. Very likely I will remain silent because if I beat Jim Eastland in June, I will have several opponents in November. Now, brother, I'm reading that. That's one line typed on top of the other. Now, them t last two lines are typed on top of each other. If you don't read that, the man. You're not a good job of reading. God. In other words, he expects he'll have independent candidates. Is that what he's and saying? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. All right. Number fourteen. Have you ever held elect? Have you ever been elected to a political office? If so, what was the office, and what did you accomplish while occupying that office? This is fun. Yes, Mayor of Moss Point and Representative from George and Jackson County. 
mayor maintained recognition of the municipal employees union in spite of some opposition from my own governing body. I handled personnel relations to the general satisfaction of our working men in all departments, maintained some understanding during our public school problem. Representative, I have an outstanding voting record. This is over John. Yeah, no. These are going to type <laughs> and on top of one another. All right, let's see. Well, no, for over 10 years I have worked in voluntary non paying capacities for reform, efficiency, and honesty in state and local government. Number 15. Do you want the open support of organized labor in your campaign for Congress? Ponder it. Yes. I want vigorous, wide open support. I am proud of my previous campaigns wherein labor helped me. When I received that support for representative, I included it on several occasions in my talk as a reason for voting for me. Well, no. He knows how to answer all Steve questions. Steve Anderson, I guarantee you, I bet you he won't. I would prefer to have some talk. <laughs> no, wait, wait a minute. I would prefer to have some time to think this over uh, if you are it. speaking of an official endorsement. I doubt if I will want the official endorsement of any organization in the state. I do want the individual no. support of working Mississippians, union and non-union, men, women, black and white. Hey, I'm just about cockeyed. I don't believe I could even cook an armadillo as a reason. Yeah. What about roast potatoes? I, don't, I couldn't do Me that. 16. Hey, one more. 16. Do you have any plans or programs not covered by this question? If so, please outline those programs. This is fun. Yes. Number one, larger tax exemption for the average man and woman. Two, support legislation limiting the presidential war participation powers to avoid, hopefully, another Vietnam. Three, a program combining the needs of our people in the public works field with jobs for the unemployed. I envision working on and introducing the Public Works Employment Act of 1972 if I am elected. Four. I would study for introduction and support laws that would send that would con laws that would control prices as strictly as wages are subjected to control. That's the end of his comment. Now let's see. Uh, well, the attached speech pretty much covers my basic philosophy as to what is needed to help Mississippi develop into a prosperous state and a good place to live and work. You know, I'm real happy I didn't read that thing before we brought it over here. I, I got the answer just like the rest of you. I didn't get a chance to read it myself. Well, I hadn't either. I, I just That's, uh, I tell you right now, I don't see going my way up. I wouldn't vote for him personally. Just read his answer. Well, he has some, he has some bad yeah, and, and the one thing I don't buy, I couldn't buy that the man don't have knowledge of the questions. If he headed up the Mississippi Economic Council of this state made up of all business people, he don't understand the questions any better than that. He damn sure don't need to go to Washington to finish it. I'm sadly disappointed in the man myself. But, uh, you know, he's been in contact with me on several occasions. Indicated his, his desire to get our support. Two opposed. Uh, the, only, the only thing it, that, uh, that you come out of it with, as I see it, is that the funders done a damn good job of answering the question. Uh, the questionnaire. He's done some research. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> if we don't, it'd have to be the man and chicken now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we put this in a very... Uh, uh, if there ever was a situation, I guess, where, the, where, where we take no position, we've got it here, and I don't see how it should go. Everybody go through the protest. The only, the only thing we'd accomplish well, by putting Taylor Webb, here's what would happen by putting Taylor Webb in Jim Easton's place there, is that we'd knock him out and Jim is the judicial committee, and then be cultivating and developing a young man that might well do the same do thing, or worse. Same thing later on, huh? Or worse. You all view it that way? Right. No, I don't see it that way. I can't vote for Jim Easton, and I can't support him, and I don't make a business in my county, in my area, that I'm going to do every damn thing I can to beat Jim Easton. Well, I don't care who runs. You, don't have, you, you have misinterpreted do. what I said. <laughs> okay. He's talking about right. voting for Easton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about supporting the guy. I'm talking about I've already made a competitor, and I've made a speech or two that I'm supporting anybody running against him. I don't yeah. give a damn what, how bad his record if he told me he's going to make a national right to work bill. I'm going to vote against I Jim suspect, Easton. I suspect that everybody so. at this table would feel the same way, Bob. Sure, I do. The question before the House is whether or not, whether or not we're going to recommend one of these characters to the membership against these. I'll tell you, I feel like we should. If we get kicked, we're going to get the system. I don't know. Well, I don't know. you got a man that can't get elected. Uh, got look at your Look at your evaluation. Now, those are know, the two know. new members here that's never sit in on one of these things. And uh, I'll, I'll let Mr. Knight explain to you how we arrive at a decision in this process. Well, I run to the restroom. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, it's important. Uh, it's important you understand all of the aspects of this. No, right? I got to see how you mean. I know. Well, you and maybe Bob let right me uh, let me just just a minute. Let me go over the instructions for that. But uh, using that room and sheet, you know, just just briefly with me here. You got the sheet before you. That uh, <coughs> here is uh, the, the, the you'll note on there a top a grade of four in each category at the top. A total grade of sixteen across the, on the right hand side is the highest that a candidate can get if he gets the top in each of the four categories. One is uh, answers to the questions, record, public office, chance of election, and then the groups or individual finances supporting the, uh, the, can the candidate, his campaign. Now, <coughs> here is the, just for the benefit of, uh, of the group, just refresh our memory, here is the way we're supposed to arrive this room in one, two, three, or four that we give in this category. Uh, just a minute. Uh, past record in public office. Now, of course, we've got a guy you know, that don't have a record. But 80 to 100 percent of the time should get a grade of four in that category. That means, you know, if their record is in support of our views, uh, 80 to 100 percent of the time uh, in that category would uh, you give them a four. Down in the category of answers to interview questions, 80 to 100, well, wait a minute, let's come on down here. 60, we're still in the, the past uh, record in public office. 60 for 80 percent of the time, a grade of three. 40 to 60 percent of the time, a grade of two. 20 to 40, a grade of one. Less than 20, a grade of zero in that particular category. All right, now let's go down to the answers to the interview questions. 80 to 100% favorable, a grade of four would be given. 60 to 80%, a grade of three. 40 to 60%, a grade of two. 20 to 40%, a grade of one, less than 20, a grade of zero. Chances of election category. Which is very important. Let's see, man. Let's be sure I got all right, all right. Extremely good or almost certain a grade of four. Good or better than good. No, wait a minute. Good or better than 50-50, a grade of three. Fair or just about even, two. Less than a 50-50, a grade of one. And very bad, of course, a zero. 
then in the other category, the groups or individuals supporting a candidate. Uh, entirely, almost entirely favorable to labor uh, would be a grade of four. A majority of whom are favorable, a grade of three. About half and half, in other words, about half of the groups or individuals would be a two. And then, of course, less than half would be one. And then all unfavorable would be zero, is the way we arrive at the one, two, three, four across the page here. Right. You know, one of the groups in the final. Yeah, that, that was the last. Well, he had no record in public office. That's well. That's right. His answers to the interview questions, you sure couldn't rate him for. The chances of election might be good. I doubt that sort. I don't think anybody will beat Eastland. Individuals or groups supporting him, I doubt if any of the groups of support would be favorable to organized labor. Matter of fact, according to the way it I don't know how in the heck he could. <laughs> One of you, one of you, take up, take your pen uh, and put U.S. Senate up at the top, and put the <laughs> name of the two candidates down, and let's let's evaluate the two of course. Don't need but one for a record, right. but we do make, need to make a record. Of course, on the other hand, honestly, see Finders change the election and the right. group support is not good. Probably. Who you but got the on that for the public office and the answers is all right. Finders first. All right, let's let's take let's take Finder now. What's the first category? Pass record, public record. All right, let's see what we got. Well, he, yeah, he, used to well, he, he was the mayor. You can't question his record as mayor of North Point. He takes on the whole Lincoln City Board down there. Yeah. You recognize that? Recognize that union and take on the board. Yeah. You can't question that. There's no doubt. Well, and he's done all right the two months he's been to the legislature. You yeah. can't question his record. So you'd have to give him four, right? Yeah, we're four. Right. Right. See, he's a good friend. <laughs> What's your next category, brother? Answer the interview question. Answer the interview question. All right. Now, what is the percentage that he's answered fair? He answered all of them. He answered all of them. He answered all of them favorable. As I can. He did qualify one or two. Well, well, he he on expanded that. on that first qualification, though. I don't think right. you could consider it an answer. Well, I put down an answer, yes, for an answer, the, yes, for the should have an answer, but then on his uh, detailed answers, I put down good and several of them, and uh, fair on the two of them. So he was a pretty good series on that. Well, have we got 80% there? They yeah. say you have. Yeah, maybe they better than you. Even some of Everybody, I mean, does everybody concur, Brother Chief? Well, that would be a four then in that category, I suppose. Yeah, he's Brother done got it out of the four. On. See, I got rid of nine out of 16 spots he had. Any of you give different marks than that? Uh, no, some of them he just ex he didn't say yes or no. He just elaborated on, but some of them is still the answer come out yes. Yeah, yeah. That's what I see. I put a yes and then put you know the comment. Well, you did. Well, even if you say less than eight, it's still getting a three. Three, yeah. Three, we mark a three on it then. It won't make any difference. All right, well, three on the committee. Yeah. All right, let's put the three in that category. What's your next chance of election? Changes of election. Zero. I mean, you want to be honest? Yeah, Well, I would, you might already give him a one. A zero is if there's no hope at all. You really don't know what a man will do for this. running, he's got hope. Right. Well, I As I understand it, that's all if it's impossible, yeah, like a McKinley yeah. or somebody, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'd say you ought to rate him one on chances of election. But yeah, individuals <laughs> or groups supporting financially. Yeah. Now, somebody have to explain that. It knows who's supporting, but I don't. Russell, do you know of anybody that's completely <laughs> adverse to us that would be... Uh, no, I don't think nobody would. Supporting? 
some of these people that we're talking about try to reach Texas with a pole because they know his, his background as far as some of the things that Texas knew and all points and everything. Who would be some of the groups supporting him, though, that you could name? Getting some, some, some. I don't know. I don't think he's like very much. Now, he only had a few I ain't heard him doing much. anything in our area. He must not be spending too much. As I said, you know how he could ride this decision, Russell, that he talked with these guys. I think he talked with E.C. Smith. Yeah, he talked with some of the bouncers. He's on the telephone campaign. Where is that? Trying to figure out who might be supporting him, if anybody. Well, let me, let me, let me kind of just kind of bring you guys up that ain't on not yet a situation you need to know about. Uh, we've had several people indicated that we try to run against Jim One of them. in my office one morning and it's real early. A little before eight, I think, so right after eight, around eight o'clock in the morning. The gentleman said this gentleman sitting in the front office up there wants to see you. I get me a cup of coffee and walk up to the front. There's Ben Wallace. Now you most of y'all know Ben. Yeah. Uh, of course he's gonna let his hair go out and try to take on the mod look and all that stuff. I've been Wallace in Green County. County. Yeah, his hair is much longer than yours now. Matter of fact, it's almost as long as one of my boys had. Anyhow, I said, would you like to have a cup of coffee? I said, he said, yeah, be well. So we got him a cup of coffee up. I told him, I said, Ben, I <coughs> got a real tight schedule. I don't have it just a few minutes. So I said, uh, we can talk while we drink this coffee, and then I got to beat it over the legislature. All right, so <coughs> I said, all right, what you got on your mind? He said, well, I'm thinking about running against Jim Easton for the Senate. I believe he can be beat this year. I said, Ben, uh, <coughs> I'll agree with you. With the proper kind of a candidate and with the proper kind of financial support, I think he can be beat. Well, I said, uh, we don't have anything at all for Eastland. Not obligated to him for a damn thing. But I said at the same time, we don't have a half a million dollars to put in about his campaign to defeat him. And I said, if you can find somebody that can raise uh, that kind of money to finance a campaign against Jim Eastland, then you come back and let me know. And we'll uh, take this matter up with our organization. We can, do, we can get them to support you. I ain't heard Mr. Ben Wallace since. Mr. Wallace has been reading the newspapers. He's read by the AFLC. I only had $70 million to spend in this election. <coughs> we assumed that we was going to get about a million and a half of it, I guess. We figured he <laughs> ought to get his cut. We didn't find out we didn't have a lot of money to spend in a senatorial race, so then he lost interest. Now, <coughs> Taylor Webb, I guess what you would call a progressive-minded businessman. Now, you can form your own conclusion on what the definition of that is. Uh, he doesn't like a lot of the things that Jim Eastman does and stands for, and apparently, if you listen to answer his questions, he, he should be classified, I guess, as one of Tom's limousine liberals. Now, maybe Tom, I will elaborate on that a little Not bit more. All right, so I don't see where we got any grounds at all uh, that we could possibly endorse uh, uh, Taylor Webb, you know, for Not several reasons. Uh, then, then we turn around, we're looking at Lewis Fondren. Uh, Lewis Fondren, uh, 
spent three days at our convention, missed all three days of the legislative session. We was constantly calling our delegates. We couldn't hardly go anywhere without running over him. He's underfoot. And he has yet to walk up to me since he's been in the legislature and tell me he'd like to have labor support uh, against him either. He simply told me one day that he was going to run against him either. That's as far as it went. You know, of course, I got a letter previous from Ransom Jones, and Ransom told me about he's going to run. He wants my views, so I told him. Told the ransom, I said, well, to begin with, I think it's a mistake. I said, I met the man that's been a good mayor. We supported him for the legislation. He's been in the legislature now for two months. He hasn't served out even one full term. Now he's taking on Mr. Big. This is <laughs> politics. I said, it appears to me that it's premature. I said, no. <coughs> Lois has, has got a good record in this respect, but I said my memory goes back farther than just yesterday. It goes back to the time that he ran against Joe Patterson, the Attorney General. Maybe some of you guys have forgot this, but I would remind you that he ran against Joe Patterson one time as an outright conservative. He had the support of the Cluxes and everybody liked that at that time. Because Joe had done some things as unpopular as far as they were concerned. And uh, then he leaves wherever it was he was, upstate somewhere, and he goes to Pascagoula from Moss Point and opens up a law office. And uh, then he becomes a liberal. <laughs> he works his way inside of our labor movement, becomes friend with our folks, and is now a friend of the blacks. Gets elected Mayor Moss Point, and he does a fairly good job as Mayor Moss Point. Based upon his record as the Mayor Moss Point, I think, more than anything else, our folks supported him for the legislature. Correct, Kelly? Yes. All right. So now he's been in two months. He's got a good voting record over two months. I'd have to say that, that he has voted all right for the last two months. What we were doing uh, was simply uh, doing an evaluation. What are we going to get him in this category? Of Individuals three? or groups supporting the financial campaign? Or three? He doesn't have three. any support financially other than his own. Of course, what he'd like, what he'd like is our endorsement, along with a half a million dollars to finance his campaign. What do you think? I wouldn't get him over a two in that category. I don't know nothing about it, but support and background. But the, the, the intent, the intent. This, uh, this category is really based on those groups or individuals that are opposed to organizing right, labor as our adversary. Right. But we don't even know. No, that's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Too late. Yeah, right. This would that's what I was saying, too, would sort of be a happy medium. <laughs> give him a two there, and let's, let's see. Now, I'd complete ten. All right, how much did that give him as a score? Ten? Yeah. Let's back up back and, up and do well. Web. Yeah. What's the first category? Hey, hey, Reagan Reagan public, public office. office. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, you, you, you can, in lieu of a record, you can consider the organizations he's been active in, his views, some of his yeah. personal views. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the organization. Answer the interview question. Well, I, I got several complete no's and several question marks. I guess you could have given them over two. I don't see how you could. I got a fair two or three there. <laughs> One, two, three, you them over two. four, five, six. I got six or seven definite no's and at least three question marks. Will you be liberal by giving them a two?
way out in front of those really important questions. Well, that, that's so that just about gives God, that takes the heart out of it when he's not sure what he do about antitrust like laws. Kind of this, this situation here is kind of like the one we faced when we ran Boris Hollum in the first time against uh, Bill Cobb. You remember this one, Jim? You were in on it. Yeah, I remember. And you were called by yeah. that. Actually, I suspect that all the money crowd of the states back of him. That's who you represented all these years, and they sure ain't with us. Who, Eastland? Well, no, Webb. Well, no. Oh, Webb's got money trouble. Eastland's cut all of his money. He can't raise a nickel in the state. He's none, he's you none mean the people in the economic council are not supporting Man, you ought to hear what he's been telling me. But who is? I know it. Huh? Eastland has got Who the money sewed up. I know one man got all the money crowd sewed up, and I pass you out a bunch of clippings. Yeah, I just had no time to read them. And you'll have to read this when you get back. He can't even get a public relations well, firm. It, it <laughs> stopped, he, had, he hired a Houston public relations firm to do his stuff for him. And Eastland and his tentacles are reached out and cut that off. Well, it one and we're bored the generous on that life. Probably, <laughs> probably what he's probably. done, he's picked it up somewhere from out of state. Well, I don't know. He's got a little money or he never well, will announce, you know. I don't know what he's done. How could you rate a guy if you don't know who's back? Well, around. this is it. If the people he's yeah, been affiliated with all these years has dropped him, and you know, doggone well, it changes his own mouth of nothing. Well, of course, the people that he's been affiliated with just aren't real or he's people. Right. Business community, right? He's pulled away from it. You're just tired of conservation. What do we give Lewis on this, too? He sure didn't go out of his way. I think we give Lewis a two, but it won't matter. You can give him whatever you want to give him. It's to give him a two, it wouldn't make any difference, but I don't know what it is. What's the score, Jack? If you give Taylor well for two there in that Two? Yeah, he'd have six. Six against ten. But I. <laughs> I'd leave that in the wide open. They can't make a recommendation. I wouldn't make it. I wouldn't support Except that we don't recommend Eastland, of course. And I ain't never have voted I for it since I got old my enough. I sure ain't going to break it by voting for him this year. For nothing. They wanted to support the working people that didn't want to support Carmichael. I knew he's Carmichael. I have you know, Paul Michael, he's supposed to be a progressive minded Republican in Meridian. He ran for what? Uh, he first got in politics, he ran for the state senate, and won a pretty good race, as I recall, against the well, race. He, he could take the position that we're going to wait and see who's in the final election in November. We can't. Uh, we can't. Sure, it'll be Eastland and somebody. No. But this will leave our folks, you know, they'll go with somebody. There's hope besides Jim Eastland, that's the only thing. Yeah, I don't see how we do anything else except be honest with them and tell them that we reviewed the, the, you know, the whole thing and this is where we come up, that we, because of Eastland's record, we see no, yep. no, no, no reason in the world why we ought to recommend him. We can't. And after evaluating the, the other two candidates, we don't see where there's any substantial ground to endorse or recommend either one out of the two that uh, that uh, that Quandren, uh, uh, comes out with a better grade, the way we grade them than what Taylor Webb does, and they just leave it up to them then to decide what they want to do. What have we got there, Jack? A ten and a six. Ten and a six. Because if we if we have endorsed Quandren, then Quandren is going to expect us to open yeah. up a bank account yeah. in his favor. See, <laughs> it's kind of like the time back when right as I was elected president of this organization. See, one of the first jobs I was faced with, Russell, was to interview candidates for governor and lieutenant governor. Uh, that, uh, the, the, that gentleman, Mr. Ross Barnett. <laughs> See, and then the other thing was uh, was the candidate for lieutenant governor. And so we wound up here in a situation where our committee, through inexperience, because a man by the name of Buckaloo from Law, Mississippi, done a good job of answering our questions like uh, Louis Fondren's done. 
So our crowd decided they would go on wrecking in support of Mr. Buckaloo. So immediately after the convention had acted, Mr. Buckaloo walked into my office one day and started telling me plans about uh, opening up a full-time office and wanted his money to start staffing it with. That's how simple it was. I don't uh, know if you should tell the grave. It might be. It might be. I don't know if you should say the grave because Bonner gets the impression there that yeah. they read, you uh, know. I'm not so sure. Just say that after we, due deliberation that we don't uh, recommend, recommend any position right. during the primary. Right. Let it go. The primary should bowl those figures a little bit one way or the other. I know. Four, but four between. Yeah, but. I, I, I we'll put two, time. like I said, for his his speeches that he's made, the progressive minded speeches for you the past 10 years. In the, in the place of the public office yeah, thing? Yeah. Give him something for his... Well, you can give him two if you want to. It still comes out eight to ten. It don't make well, no I'm difference. Well, I'm simply saying, since we can't make an endorsement, obviously, that I think maybe it might be good to reconsider and put the grades a little closer together there somehow. Of course, it's it actually right. comes out the way it is. Well, that's right, right too. And I'm just thinking about <laughs> I'm disappointed in Taylor Webb, I'll tell you. Boy, the way he answers some of them questions, you can tell I am too. I from what side of the fence he's from. I thought we had a man that had a little courage and ready to take on somebody, but he, he's... Somebody, somebody he's put real dumb on him when he was associated I'm with very disappointed in him. Found, well, see, lucky. here's what you here's what you have, and I don't, I'm not sure you have anything when you, when you do this, but when you meet with these people personally, uh, you get in this business you call leave me with me. You know, yeah. and you get the answer sometimes. You yeah, but it ain't but worth I'm not nothing. so sure it's worth it. If they do oh, it just because oh, you want right. to hear it, they uh, find out what you want. Right. They'll answer. They have been occasions, so though, I believe, when we met with people and, and we had time to explain to them a little. You know, a lot of these people, lawyers and whatnot, they're really dumb about some of the labor laws that we talk yeah, about. Sometimes you but can way explain up them. Be, Tom, they can that economic council because uh, they had whole programs on how yeah, to defeat right. labor and how to go right. about it and what's good and maybe what's bad. So uh, Maybe he is a lightweight, you know, and they found out about it before we did, you see. But anyhow, I agree that what the heck, turn the people loose and let them go to the polls and vote for America. <laughs> we can go Republican. Uh, uh, we not going to do anything in, with, uh, in the Republican primary? You know, we didn't send them to Meredith. No, Republican what will? What we we'll probably no, no, what we will do is wait till the primaries is over with. I guess, huh? Did you send anything out to Republicans? Not, well, not for the Senate. Not for the Senate. You sent that to it. You did for the House, didn't you? Yeah, in the district, in your district. Well, one, there but one way to take it that we take no position in the primaries. Period. Wait to see who's in the runoff. That we'll wait and see who the Republican okay. nominee is and who the Democratic four. nominee is. Well, it'll be Eastland and. And that we then attempt to put in the interview, see, we'll have more time then. At that we point, we'll try to set up and personally interview the candidate. Did you want uh, to this I don't, I don't think I don't tell them let me, uh, let, 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 me uh, let me say what Bonner said to me. He came out there and brought the question. I was busy, but he insists on coming back there, and I told Carolyn let him come back there in a few minutes. He sat down and told me, he said, well, I know that, that uh, what I'm up against, what we're up against, he said. I said, uh, well, that's true. And I told him, uh, I pointed out to him, I knew he was familiar with the procedure you use in evaluating candidates for legislation. I told him, I said, Lewis, our committee is going to meet, and uh, we will evaluate the questionnaires of the candidates that respond. And we'll report to our full board, and then they in turn will report to the full sure. post committee. And I says, uh, we will then reach some decision. And he told me, he says, well, he says, I think we ought to work together on this thing. And if me or Webb, he says, if one of us, and I know he's talking about Webb, can 
get in the race with Jim, and I think the other one all fall in there with him, and everybody team up and try to beat this guy. Well, I agree with him. Yeah, yeah, Shoot, they won't even be a run. I predict they won't no, even be a run off. No, the East no, one will no, beat no, both no. of them in the first vote. Because we got, we got a bunch of people in our organization that's really going to fall off a well once we report. You know what's happening. Yeah, He's been better all night to answer. Well, he'd have been yeah. better off to stay home yeah. that day. He's been a sad disappointment to me because he's went out of his way. I was hoping to, we uh, had a man. He's went yeah. out of his way, Taylor Webb has, to uh, God, contact you. me. You, you remember he showed up at our convention, <coughs> and uh, I have to spot him and introduce him, asking him to stand up and be yeah. recognized, uh, you know. I had hoped we'd found a man. Well, that question that ruined him, didn't it? It sure did. Well, it was it was such a. I guess you'll have to. The questions he see. went, the questions he really answered no on, was so important oh, to yeah. us as an organization. It's just, yeah. it's just no way. If it had been some of them, it was just general public interest. Yeah. Then you could have sort of looked at that. But I mean, he went right to the heart of the thing, and his answers was either he didn't know or it was no. Exactly. He didn't. Like said, he didn't want our endorsement, you know, and he answered some questions. Well, let that. me, um, <laughs> let me, Mr. Chairman, if I may, we're representing the Congressional National Farm Court. Yeah. Uh, well, let's get this out of the way. Uh, let's get a motion for the record that uh, I'm sure the motion is we take over possession in the Democratic primary. So who wants to offer the motion? The Senate. The Senate. Could you so move? Second. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Of course, of course, we'll make this information available on the 29th before the court committee about it. You know, right. And, you know, you guys now have a chance to comment at that time uh, for the benefit of the other group. All right, now you want to talk about... The only the thing I want to say was this, Claude, and this is not going to be easy, and we've all got it. Each of the kits, we've got a set of instructions as to what we go by on this evaluation sheet. Right. Now, we've got some people based on some conversations that I've had with different people at our convention that have some pretty strong feelings about certain, certain candidates. candidates. Now, I mean, they're a little closer personally to some of them. And we, all, we, we all have this. This is only human. So I would urge you uh, tomorrow to try to explain as best you can. You will have people on these committees, never been on a committee before, not familiar with our system, that uh, we do need to adhere to the letter of the law, so to speak, on the evaluation system. And we've got some good men in these races, and for goodness sake, let's try not to let these personal ties get in our way, because we can very easily offend some of our good friends in this. But I do know we got some people in leadership positions that have got some real strong feelings about some of these folks. So I don't know really, and I did this purposely, and Claude added too, I have not read one single answer to any of the congressional questionnaires. I just don't know what they are. We may find all together something just like this. We may get the shock of our life or something. This shocked things. me. I and thought nothing. we had a guy just looking at him and talking. No, no, no the lieutenant Gump. Uh, <laughs> another lieutenant governor. <laughs> yeah. How about that? Uh, That's okay. Well, but at least we educated one of them. <laughs> we educated one of them when he posed that question in that room on the corner down there the second time around. He said he wanted our support any way he could get it. Yeah, and then doggone it, we fouled up and didn't then get we it. We fouled up and didn't <laughs> get it. <laughs> 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 Uh, you see? He made he made a mistake. I ain't know that one yet. Yeah. Around <laughs> make one on the second round. See. Well, how about that? Anyhow, it, it, I don't think it's really made that much that difference with Bill, though, has it? Oh no 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 no! I tell you, I wouldn't want to work with a better guy. He's really been better to work with than Charlie was, and Charlie was very very good to work with. So the one time, Boy, I'm my we've had we an opportunity to be the one of them and win. We've we're still in the best shape we've ever been. 
you know, for whatever it might be worth, <laughs> all the way from the governor on down, with the exception of the cat that Tom mentioned a while ago, as far as state government officials concerned, we're in the best shape we've ever been. And old Hank Brown, I called over that the other day, and uh, Hank told me they might have a little money to spend. I'm glad now that uh, we made this decision because I'm supposed to get a thousand dollars out of them, so it won't be spent the senator raise. It'll be spent otherwise. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyhow, we got money right before the president of this insurance company. I called him, and he, he in turn got Hank on the phone. Old Hank, he was just taken to death with what he saw over here at our convention. And he said, you guys keep going, you're going to show the rest of the nation how to get the job done. I said, well, Frank, we're working, I mean, uh, Hank, we're working on that situation. And, uh, I think you might well be right. He was very impressed, you know, with the, especially with the lieutenant governor yeah. and uh, some of the other people, the speakers that they heard. And then, uh, Jerry Clower just turned him upside down that night. <laughs> He'd never heard anything just like that. Uh, anyhow, uh, we are in real good shape now. Of course, we got a good working relationship with the Attorney General's office. There's two men. Not uh, necessarily with the Attorney General himself, but with some of his top fighters. You got three men over there George Samuel, W.D. Coleman, brother of the judge, and old uh, Dealers Burke. You can go in there, and if you need to know something, you can find it out from them three. You know, either one of them. But that, that grinning pecker wood, that summer, he is. I think you're crazy. Well, I tell you, I used to listen. I used to really think that guy. Claudia, you coming to Brookhaven tomorrow? I'll morning. be tomorrow at Brookhaven. Oh. What time is that meeting? 10 o'clock. What? Where? It's a holiday, and you don't read your damn mail? Holiday Inn. <laughs> you you know, know, it's, it's a Holiday Inn. Oh, Ten o'clock, and we will provide lunch for the committee. You know, I'm, I'm really and worried. You mentioned the state FLCIO. Listen, I, I'm really worried about, worried about this mail mess. Now, last night, <coughs> Curtis Orman, a member of our board, called me. He's on the committee in the second district. And he, the last thing he got from us was the letter where he was appointed to the committee. He did not get his notice of the meeting. He did not get his copy of the questionnaire or the letter that went to the campus. And I hope this hadn't happened. He hadn't moved or anything. He told me last night, he says, what on earth is going on? I said, what you talking about, Curtis? He said, well, I understand I'm on the interview committee, second congressional district. I said, well, uh, you got copies of everything went to the candidates, copies of, I mean, notice of the meeting? He said, I haven't got a thing. I said, well, good buddy, you're supposed to be in Winona Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. So I just told them. Tell them what's the one we got back. Don't call no names. Well, sir, I sent this material out to the members of the committee. What we tried to do, we tried to get a good representative committee, organization-wise, as best we could without having just a room full of people. I wrote them a letter. Each one told them they'd been selected as a member of the committee. If they, could, if they couldn't serve, please advise, otherwise we'd depend on them. Well then, when I got the material ready, the letter that went to the candidate with the questionnaire and the questionnaire, I sent everybody a copy of that so they'd have it. So the day before yesterday morning, I opened up a letter from this person who is an officer of a local union, and that person filled out that question. Like he's running for Congress. <laughs> <laughs> good Lord of it. Uh, no, it was a good hey. job. <laughs> hey, before, we, uh, before we break up, uh, well, maybe we ought to run it. <laughs> and him, it's a her. Oh, oh it's a her. <laughs> oh, God. And she, she's not white. We just have to deal with that. Any, anyhow, uh, Bob, you're going to be at the thing tomorrow, and, and of course, between tomorrow. you and I, we'll try to guide the thing, and, and, and I will make you a suggestion. Uh, George Johnson hopefully will be there. I'm going to call him every while to make sure he's there and invite him. As a matter of fact, he'll go down with me if he wants to. Jack, are you going to be able to be there? As far as I know now, I will. You will? We might all get together and go down in one car if you'd like. Okay. Uh, I'll have to leave a little early. What time are you on? 
Well, I told him I'd try to, I need to be down there somewhere around 9, no later than 9.30. My, uh, this will be the only thing that I know of right now. Yeah. My wife's stepmother is just hanging by the spider mm. web. Well, then, probably I'd better then just call George. If George wants to go with me, he can meet me, and then if you can come, you come. If you can't, we'll understand why you couldn't get there. Right. Then if you're not there, it'd be up to Bob and myself to kind of guide this one. Now, George Johnson, who's president of the Jackson Central Body, is a heck, heck of a nice fellow. And he's had considerable experience in interviewing candidates and so forth, so I think he'd be an ideal chairman. Then we'll have to, you see, what we got to do is to get that committee organized. We're going to have to get a chairman elected and a secretary elected to keep minutes of the meeting. You see, other than me and you, see, we're just going to be there in advisory capacity from the state yeah, organization. And James and Kelly is going to handle the fair. Tom is going to take the, and take Well, we out. already got our chairman now, V.C. Smith. So y'all yeah, He's already set there. up, yeah. And how you yeah, don't go, you, you won't have to go through the Second organizational process brewer, yeah. with Will and the other two. But we'll have to find us a good secretary. And we'll look the crowd over and get on there and do a little guided democracy. Uh, and see who all's there. Anyhow, first thing we'll have to do is get the committee organized. That's in the third and the second. See? Now, James, you and Kelly will be responsible for getting a report prepared for the. 29th meeting. Well, you know, I'm going to miss the 29th meeting, so he's going to have to do All right, so you, report. Kelly, Kelly. I then. won't be here. I'll be in Atlanta. All right, Kelly, along with who? Well, you have V.C. Smith. V.C. will be. He'll probably make the report, you know, and, of course, you put him on notice that we expect him to make that report. Then whoever we elect chairman, these other two will make the report, you know, to the full committee. Then, of course, uh, we'll let Mr. Knight make the report on the senatorial plan. You know, and uh, this, of course, is going to be at the Sheraton Inn out on 55 North, and we'll try to get a reminder of this out Monday. Uh, have, have, did all of you get the notice of the meeting? Yeah, I did. It seems like we've got a mail problem, huh? So I got I just asked if it invokes some questions. <laughs> it's all that stuff together over there, so I can right. pick it out. Right, let's all go to the office. I don't think so. I don't think so. And I think that... Uh, that it'd probably be better to s include that banquet in the uh, restoration fee because uh, the local land will be paying. So what's the what's the opinion of you can you, you out there with your local people more than we are? I think it, I think it's coming out a lot better for the purpose of the banquet and for the purpose of bringing in the banquet to the banquet.
section of that proposal. Are you satisfied with the menu? <laughs> well, now, three years ago we had John Henry Paul here as our manager. Put his name down here. He might just be the guy. I wonder how you go by getting him.